Hello, hello, Danger Noodles. It is I, the good at the brain. And no, this is not my room. <laughs> it's just a, it's just, just a creepy little room. And I've got some stories to read. Is everyone ready to hear some stories? I feel like you need to eventually get a outfit for your avatar that fits a darker theme a little more. I actually do have some outfits, like, hold on, Jerry. I can actually, because there are some outfit ideas I have in the future that... Robin Drop said, Bright is ready, I'm ready. Yeah. Thanks, here we go. That would definitely be darker. Yeah, and this one would go for the immortal form. There will be some details that will be changed, but that. Because there's more stuff for it, the stuff that comes out the back to come out. There's more room. We definitely have very different styles of clothing. Yeah. <laughs> Granted, I do have a god design, but, like, I lost it. It's mainly like a, a hoodie goth outfit. But I lost Robin it. Drock, uh, Robin Drock said, I'd read Mortuary Elementary, but only in Chapter 2. So it is good story, even if not done yet. Oh, are they re writing a story or something? I I think so. Oh. Anyways, you ready to hear the first story? I mean, I already asked that. So, wait, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. I shall read the first story, which is Don't Let Them In. <clears throat> Addiction took over our mother slowly. The doctor threw it and sung her to sleep sunk deep into the mattress on her bed. When her back teeth fell out, she left them on the side of the bathtub. I was seven and I kept them in a matchbox. The missing pieces of her kept safe so that she wouldn't be lost forever. So maybe one day, we could put her back together. Our house fell around us, and we tried our best to raise ourselves. The ceilings had water damage, the bottom stairs had dry rot, and in the winters, the radiators bled rust. But it was still our house, and Annie made it a home. My sister Annie mothered me with lopsided band-aids on bruised knees and lukewarm microwave meals. She told me ghost stories and didn't mind when I crawled into her bed later on. Too scared to sleep alone, she taught me to dance, barefoot on the living room carpet, music channel on full volume on the TV, shaking our pre-adolescent hips. She always let me shower first so that I can enjoy the hot water 
and never complained when she had to make do with the cold. She brushed my hair every day before school, even when I screamed and hit her with when she caught the tangles. Annie was dark-haired like her father, whoever he had been, but I was blonde. Annie was des desperate to be blonde too, like Marilyn Monroe. Unlike Mom, I think she thought it would make them closer, remind Mom less of her dad. I'd give anything for her to have her hands in my hair one more time, even if it hurt. She moved to New York when I turned 18 and never came back. I still dream about her sometimes. Being up with our mother was impossible, and we learned from a young age that we would always be left behind. It didn't make it any easier. When she was drinking light, she was radiant and would wake us up at 3 a.m. with pancakes dripping in cherry syrup. Sometimes when the weather was right and she had enough being drunk alone, she would call our school up and tell them we had both come down with summer sickness and we'd drive to the beach instead. I remember being nine years old in the back seat of the car, coming home after one of our ocean days, sucking the salt from my fingers. Annie had just dyed her hair blonde. Her best friend Jane helping her bend over our ki kitchen sink. From behind, I could tell who was the mother and who was the daughter. Radio up and windows down. Blowing the sky inside. When she was drinking heavily, she'd be out all night. Hair piled up like a beauty queen. Eyes glazed over and ringed with glitter and black. Sometimes she'd be gone a day or two. She would never give us advance notice. One day, we'd just wake up to an empty house and with the fridge packed full of a post-it note on its door, complete with a smear of mom's lipstick and the outline of a kiss, telling us she'd be back soon. Sometimes she'd bring guys home, filling the table with beer cans and ashtrays, smoke up to the ceiling, mom lost in the haze. We'd sleep with pillows over our heads, trying to drown out the music they would blast all night, and wake up to strangers at our kitchen table in the morning, asking us where we kept the coffee. When mom drank too little, she fell apart. She wouldn't buy food and the refrigerator went bare. She chain smoke, leaving cigarette burns on the wallpaper up the stairs like the walls were sick and decaying. She barely slept, walking around with blue half moons under her eyes. Knuckles raw, she would scream at the slightest thing. I remember once when I spilled a glass of juice on the couch. She looked over at me with dead eyes and dragged me off onto the carpet and then took every single cushion off the couch and went into the backyard and set, and set them on fire. Annie went to watch a while from the window and then sat next to me on the floor, backs pressed against the skeleton of the seats, head resting in the crater of my collarbones. It was worse when Mom drank too much. She laughed too loudly and too long at anything and everything until her mouth started to shake. And she began to cry into her cereal at, bre at the breakfast table. Annie shut down when Mom was like this, going somewhere deep inside her herself where no one could hurt her. She stayed up until morning, watching old black and white movies on TV, 
whispering the lines like she knew by heart like prayers. When I was five years old, I'd cry when I find Mom passed out on her bed. Sure, she would never wake up. Annie would wipe my tears and tell me she was only sleeping. Like the princesses in my storybook, we would sit on Mom's bed together and wait for her to wake up. When we were older, I was the one who pick, who would pick Mom up off the bathroom floor again and again, and Annie would put her to bed, smoothing her hair off her face, wiping the vomit from her mouth, and changing her clothes if she pissed herself. Watching them then, there was no doubt that Annie was the mother now. It was October, and I was 13. Annie, 16. It was a Wednesday night, and Mom had gone for two days. She called us that morning from a payphone, voice slurring, telling us she was having the best time with all of her new friends, and that she hoped we were doing fine. When she asked me if I was having a good birthday, I hung up on her. My birthday had been the day before. Annie had given me a pile of presents. Strawberry lip gloss and glittery nail polishes. I didn't ask where she'd gotten the money for them. I didn't care. We had taken the bus to the beach with Jane and ate the birthday cake she had made for me. I sand getting into the frosting. It tasted like sweetness and the sea and I savored every bite and scrape of sugar against my teeth. We watched the sun go down, Annie snapping granny photos on her Nokia as I blew out my candles, wishing over and over that Mom wouldn't come home, that she stayed gone this time. But that Wednesday night, Annie and I weren't speaking. Anger hung heavy between us. Seeping through the floorboards, it began when she tripped at the bottom of the stairs. We both laughed, Annie throwing her head back, the gap between her front teeth catching the light. When I'd bent to pick her up, I felt her breath warm against the freckles on my cheeks. I let go of her arms, and she fell again, hitting the floor and grinning, shaking her hair from her face. Her breath was heavy with whiskey. I, c I couldn't start picking her up, too. Couldn't watch her fall again and again. Just like Mom, I knew she'd never get back up. I stared down at her, blonde hair hanging over her eyes, and all I could see was our mother. Then I was running, feet slamming the hallway like Heartbeats turned loose. I'd run for the kitchen and tipped every bottle we had down the seek, sink. Why did I say sink? Sink, shoving Annie back as she fought to stop me. Catching liquor, uh, catching liquor on her hands as it fell. She grabbed my shoulders and made me drop the very last bottle. It smashed between us on the floor. Glass shards shining like we dragged the stars out of the sky and broken them like pieces we could never put back. Outside through the open windows, the sky turned pale gold. The clouds a mess of pink and cream. Uh, fuck. Cream smeared across the horizon. I cried then, watching my sister on her knees, picking up the pieces. That was Annie, always trying to fix things, even when it was too late. The smell of food dragged me from my room, my stomach turning traitor against my ribcage. Annie was cooking pasta, real food not made in a microwave. She set the table. 
Tammy Wynette singing softly from the CD player. Annie gently swaying her hips as, he sh as she stirred the tomato sauce, rich and warm, as we ate in silence. I forgave her more with every bite. Mom never cooked dinner, never remembered my favorite had been spaghetti since I was a kid. I never stayed sober long enough to sit up at a table. Annie wasn't mom. We were washing the dishes when we first heard it. A moth was crawling down the inside of the pane, and it cracked the window to let it out into the dark. From the backyard came a faint sound. I tilted my head to listen as it was coming from far off, crying. I figured it was Mika, the two-year-old next door, having a tantrum loud enough for us to catch, or maybe even Lucky Strike, the cat that belonged to the junkies down the street, begging for food like he sometimes did. I always wanted to feed him when he came around, winding over my ankles, but Annie always stopped me, saying once you started giving, they'd never stop taking. Looking back, I don't think she was talking about the cat. Annie flipped the Christmas lights strung up around the porch, and we sat on the plastic beach chairs, watching the skies. When we were little, we'd sit outside, and Annie would tell me the names of all the constellations and the stories of how they came to be hung up in the night sky. I had to grow up before I realized she made them all up as she went along. It was a game we still like to play now, making up ridiculous stories for the shapes we could pick out. Ah uh, yes, that one is the colors is Coors Light. It got there when God dropped it out of, of his confetable window and never picked it up. She said, nodding sagely and hiding her smile. Of course, I said, waving my hands and pointing up past the power lines. Right next to the ashtray left there by angels on a smoke break. Yeah, they say if you, if you wish on it, all your dreams will come true, said Annie with a grin. Then she stopped laughing, and her voice grew quiet, face tilted up to all those dead stars. Let's wish, Emmy. Let's wish. So we did. The sound of wailing interrupted us. It was closer this time, and definitely human. We turned to one another in confusion. Annie shrugged, and I squinted into the black. It sounded like a baby, lost, tired, and alone. It must be Mika, I said, slowly getting to my feet. Maybe he walked around the back? Do you want to call Connie and tell her we'll bring him over? Annie didn't reply. I sighed and rolled my eyes. Okay, I guess I'll do everything then. I stepped off the porch, grass soft against my heels. The air smelled like it might rain, fresh and clean and growing. A promise unfulfilled. M? Annie's voice was strained. I turned to her with a smile. It died on my face when I saw the look on her own. Em, get inside now. She was staring out into the dark, past me and opening the door with one hand behind her. Uh, behind her. Fingers fumbling on the latch. I froze barefoot in the dirt. I had glanced what she was looking at. In the bushes, by the back fence, Someone was crouching with their knees tucked up neatly under his chin, and his arms wrapped around his legs. His mouth was agape, softly opening and closing as he cried. 
Like a child lost in the dark. No, not like a child. More like someone pretending, mimicking the sound. Under cover of darkness. Suddenly they straighten their back, snapping upright. Face still obscured by shadow. They were tall and slim. Extraordinarily thin by human standards. Panic made me move. Carried forward by animal instincts left over from a time when people still lived in nature. I was faster than Annie, dragging her inside and slamming the door behind us, hearing it bounce on its hinges as I locked it. We watched as the person slowly approached the house with long, deliberate strides. Annie reached out for my hand, holding me tight, and turned me to face her, holding my shoulders. Don't turn around, Emmy, don't turn around. Instinctively, I started to look over my shoulder into the gloom. Annie grabbed my face hard and shook her head. I knew then she was serious. I'm... Her voice cracked, and she cleared her throat, gripping my hand tight enough to hurt. Nails digging in, grounding herself. I looked down at her interlocked fingers, both of us born of the same bones. I'm coming to call the cops, and everything is going to be... Her voice faltered, stuttering. Tears spilled over her lashes. Annie never cried. Your phone's on the porch, she whispered, and bio crawled its way up my throat. Her phone was upstairs, charging. A soft tap, tap, tapping filled the silence. Annie turned wide-eyed to the window. It was the sound of someone's forehead slowly and repeatedly bumping against the glass. Then the blows accelerated, gaining in both speed and strength. Skin meeting glass until they were slamming into the window hard enough to shake the panes. A moment later, the tapping stopped. I was about to ask Annie if I could look now. Then, when she screamed, followed by the sound of cracking glass and a tremendous crash. Whoever was in our yard had just smashed their face hard enough into the window to shatter it. We ran up the stairs two steps at a time, skipping the rotted ones out of habit. I turned to look behind me once, and Annie yanked my face back before I could see. The sound of glass breaking echoed behind us as we made it to the bathroom and locked the door. A weak, mewling cry like that of an infant calling for its mother fill the hallway trapped between the walls and entryways. Annie threw her, threw her back against the door, feet jammed up against the bathtub. Clutching a knife she had grabbed from the kitchen, I joined her shoulder to shoulder and did the same. Slow footsteps started on the stairs. Calculated and casual, the crying took on a mocking quality. Resembling laughter, arriving in short, shrill bursts of sound, followed by high-pitched giggling, and then silence, only to start again a moment later. The, for the first door on the upstairs floor was my bedroom, and we heard a distinct sound of it slamming open. They were looking for us. What, what the fuck is going on? I asked Annie, not even bothering to brush away the tears that I couldn't keep from falling. I watched my sister pick herself up off the floor. <laughs> Embrace her hands on the door as we heard a sound of a second door slamming open. Mom's room. The next room on the hallway was the bathroom. Annie pulled me to my feet and handed me the knife. I shook my head and pushed it back to her, terrified 
of what would happen if I had to use it. And he shoved me and pressed the knife into my hands, thumb pressing hard enough to, along the edge to draw blood. I watched a winding road of crimson rivulets cascading down her wrist. In spite of the pain, Annie continued pushing the blade into my hands. Finally, I took it from her. Something slammed, it, slammed against the wall that Mom's room sh shared with the bathroom. A high-pitched howl followed. I held my breath and felt my heart beating frantically in the base of my throat. I'm gonna get the phone from my room, my sister said. I shook my head dramatically in protest. Before I could say a word, Annie clamped a hand over her mouth. I could taste the blood on her hand, salty and sweet, like like birthday cake by the ocean. Yes, I'm going gonna get the phone, and I'm going to call the cops. We're gonna be okay. I shook my head again. It's the only way, Annie insisted. When I go, I need you to lock the door, and I don't want you to open it for anything or anyone. Not for me, not for anyone. Promise me. I shook my head, and Annie pressed her ha hand against my mouth, pushing my teeth against my lips so forcefully it made my eyes water. Promise me, Em. Something smashed in the room next door, and he brushed the hair from my face and gently tucked it behind my ear. Promise, she mouthed, and unlocked the door as slowly as possible, the bolts sc scraping gently. I watched the curve of her shoulder disappear into the darkened hall, like the moon in eclipse, and then she was gone. I couldn't move or breathe for a second, and then I slammed the bolt shut just as something bounced off the outside of the door. A high-pitched scream ensued, followed by the handle rattling up and down hard enough to pop a screw loose. I watched it roll toward me on the tiles, and then everything went still. I sat with my back to the door, holding the knife, and wishing I was holding Annie's hand instead. The silence continued. For a moment, the only sound was that of my breath slowly filling the room. A voice broke the illusion of solitude. Em? A familiar voice came through the door. Startled, I, I gripped the knife even more firmly than before. Honey, what's going on? Mom? My voice cracked. Mom, is that you? I wrapped my arms around myself to keep from shaking. Sweetie, it's okay. Just open the door. It's okay. Just let me in. The handle rattled again. Gentler this time. Just let me in. It's all okay. She banged impatiently on the door, and I took the handle of the bolt. bolt. Honey, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I missed your birthday. I'm sorry I'm such a terrible mother. Please. Her voice broke, and she started to cry. Just let me in, baby. I'm so sorry. I screwed my eyes shut. She pounded, sounded so sad and so lost. I just wanted to ho her to hold me like as... Hold me as like she did when I was a kid. When I come in with a scraped knee after falling off the swings... Maybe this time she meant it. Perhaps it would be it would all be okay. My hand found its way to the bolt again. My sister's voice came through the door, warm and gentle. Yeah, Emily, let us in. It's all okay. My hand froze on the bolt and I tightened my grip on my weapon. Annie never called me by my full name. A hand banged on the door. Handle rattling. Emily, let us in! Annie's voice became low and guttural, followed by the same shrill, 
giggles from before. Mom spoke now, pleading and crying, her voice growing louder and louder. Let us in! Let us in! Let us in! She shouted over and over again, punctuated by her fist on the door. I thought about Bentine's stories and all the demons and monsters we pray never crawl out from under our beds. That's not my sister, and you're not my mother. I screamed through the door, hands over my head. I climbed into the bathtub, curled into the fetal position, and clutched a knife to my chest. I didn't know what it was outside that door, but I knew it wasn't Annie, and it wasn't the voice that scolded me. Whenever I changed the TV channel. The one that sang me happy birthday. The one that told me I was smart. Even when I got bad grades. The one that read me stories about princesses. That never wake up. It wasn't human. Bangs and yells came from downstairs. Followed by the footsteps of people running. A low guttural howl. Ripped through the house. Filling the room until I felt like I was drowning in the sound. And then the door was kicked in. I screamed, covered my eyes, and waited to die. A moment later, arms found me, lifted me from the tub, and carried me from the room. I looked at the outside of the door, and I was taken downstairs. Its exterior was covered in long, scraping claw marks, stretching to the floor. I found the hallway covered in, in a soft downy remains of torn up pillows, making it appear as if it had snowed indoors. I watched the tiny feathers drift slowly as men in uniforms checked each of the rooms that looked like they had been ripped apart by something feral. Outside police cars and an ambulance waited in her driveway, and there in the middle of it all was Annie, bathed in blue and red light and glowing in the dark like a neon angel. I threw myself on officer's shoulders and ran at her. Then I held us both together, broken pieces and all, standing under all those constellations we'd, we'd concocted. Muffled screaming came from the ambulance, which rocked occasionally. Annie gently turned my head away, smiling so sadly it made my chest ache. I understood. It turns out there was no demon, no wild animal. Or bad men trying to break in. It was just mom. Out of her mind on booze. Drugs. And everything in between. Coming to an, the end of the week long binge. Something had finally broken inside her head. And this time. We couldn't put her back together. No matter how hard we tried. Sometimes you fall one. Sometimes you fail one last time. Oh wait sorry. Sometimes you fall one last time and then never get back up. Annie had seen her rail thin frame in the garden, blood dripping from her mouth, track marks bulging from her forearms, like unmapped roads, desperate for one more hit, one more fix. She searched the kitchen for all the alcohol I'd thrown away, and when she hadn't found any, she went hunting for the stash hidden in the bathroom. She hadn't wanted me, just the drugs on the other side of the door. She'd been so high she was able to mimic Annie's voice nearly perfectly. The real monsters are the ones that eat you alive slowly. The kind that comes in a bottle or a needle. Or at the end of, of a long list of reasons why you can't get out of bed in the morning. Sometimes the monsters are the ones that raise you. Or love you the most. But it's up to you to let them in. And that's it. That was depressing. You know, it's kind of fucked that I was the one who, had, who read this story now. <laughs> Right. 
Yeah. You're wonderful. <laughs> I'm hyper cream. Now, Jeff, you gotta like find my throat. <laughs> All right. So that was don't let them in. What's everyone in chat think of it? It was a short story. It was, and it's a nine point zero eight out of ten. <laughs> At first, I, I thought it was going to be like a, a skinny boy story. Of course, I'm not going to say it's actual monster name because I know it's Taboo. <laughs> Are you okay, Robin? <laughs> it's a great story. I liked it. Yeah. There is actually something I'm going to probably do. Uh, probably next week. I'm going to have to change my Twitch schedule again. We're probably on my next day off. I'm probably going to do a stream just reading SCP stories. I couldn't quite hear you. Uh, hold on. Is this quick cutting me off? Hold on. I was basically saying next week on my next day off, I'm gonna read SCP stories instead of creepy pasta ones. Ah, oh, very nice. Yeah. Yeah. This came out fits perfectly. Anyways, are we ready for the next story? Bookworm said yes. Uh... Are you ready, Jerry? All right. The next story is Charles Bonnet Syndrome. I suffer from a condition called Charles Bonnet Syndrome. My visual release hallucinations. If you want to get more technical, it's a condition that's far more common than you might realize. It's estimated that as many as half of the people with gradual loss of vision will experience one or more bouts over their lifetime. Yet, I'm willing to bet that most of you have never heard of it. The reason for that is because most sufferers are scared to tell anybody what we experience. I know I was. But I'm getting ahead of myself. My name is Andrew. And I'm 26. Two years ago, I woke up with awful blurred vision 
every single edge and detail clouded as if someone if somebody had smeared Vaseline on a camera lens. It never got better. I was scared then and got over to Dr. Harper's surgery as fast as I could, sudden, suddenly needing to take a cab rather than climb in the car. I'd driven without incident ever since. I bought it three years prior. The doctor did some tests and asked me some questions. Have you been much thirstier lately? How often do you urinate? How would you describe your tiredness levels? And then gave me the diagnosis that changed my life forever. Diabetes. Type 1. He explained that I would need to take insulin shots with every meal. That eating the wrong foods without monitoring my blood sugar could see me drop in into a coma or worse. Then he got to my eyes. Andrew, your diabetes has resulted in maculopathy. Do you know what that is? I shook my head dumbly, already reeling with the shock of my diagnosis, and Dr. Harper went on. It's when the diabetes affects the blood vessels at the back of your eye, blocking them and causing them to leak into the macula. A central part of your ret retina that helps you perceive color and fine detail. When these blood vessels leak into the macula, it can cause significant damage. For the lump in my throat, I asked. Okay, so how do we make this better? I couldn't see Harper's face properly when he spoke, but his tone of voice was enough to tell me what I had been dreading. I'm sorry, Andrew, he replied gravely. Perhaps if we got this a little sooner, we might have had some treatment options available to us. But I'm afraid the damage has been pretty extensive. We can take steps to arrest the development of the condition, but I'm afraid it's irreversible. I felt as if my world had come crashing down around me. I was 24, still at my physical peak. I was active, playing basketball, and cycling a couple times a week. And now my health, my body, and my sight had been taken from me. The first six months were tough. I broke up my with my girlfriend, a sweet girl called Holly, who tried to make it work, but couldn't because I was so damn angry all the time. I lost my job because if there's one thing an architect needs, it's, it's, it's his eyes. I even fell out with a lot of my friends, making excuses to not meet with them until they stopped asking. In truth, it was jealousy on my part. Envy that they got to keep on living with everything I'd ever hoped for had been snatched away. I became a recluse never leaving my apartment, barely bothering to wash, shave, or get dressed each day. I was so sure that my life was over. I stopped even trying to live, live it. I was an asshole. It took me a long time to realize this, but in the end, it was a nurse assigned to visit me at, at home. A tall, no-nonsense experienced woman called Lois, who brought this to my attention. You're an asshole, she said. What? I grasped, shocked by her language. So you got diabetes. Do you know how many people do? She asked. Then before waiting for my answer, she continued. Do you think they all hide in their apartments, refusing to get on with their lives? Losing your vision is a terrible thing, and you do have my sympathy. But Andrew, it's no excuse to give up. But you don't, I argued, trying to defend myself. But she hadn't finished. Understand? She growled. One of the bravest men I know was paralyzed from the neck down when he was just a child and he hasn't given up. You can do so much with your life. 
and you have people who, that want to help you do that, but you can't even be bothered to, sh to shave that ugly fucking beard off. Stop being a crybaby. Make a fucking difference. Of course, it didn't happen overnight, and I argued with her. I was furious at her blunt insensitive insensitivity and told her to leave. I said I'd tell I tell her superiors, but she laughed and told me I wouldn't. You wouldn't because you're a smart guy. You've got to too much pride for that, she said. I'll see you next week. That night I shaved. I opened my curtains and actually looked around. Things were blurry. But when I l really looked, I could see the things scattered around my home. The mess I'd let it become. When Lois came back the following week, the place was tidy. I was clean shaven, dressed. I even attempted to comb my hair. She didn't say anything about it. Didn't mention the argument of the week before. But she took me out for coffee down the street. She guided me along the sidewalk to the coffee shop. Talking to me, reassuring me. It was daunting, even though it was less than a block away. But I felt so proud when I got there. We talked, me and Lois. I think I even laughed. Afterwards, she walked me home. Then, when she helped me back inside, she said, It's nice to meet you at last, Andrew. That day was the beginning of my new life. I moved to a new apartment, a ground floor place, and joined a group of other young people with visual impairments. I made friends. I got out every day, even if it was just a short walk, but I made a point of seeing what I could of the world. I bought what I could, but the Sawyers, the old couple that ran the local store, would bring my groceries by once a week. Clark's a gruff old coot. So he refused to coddle me, and he's told me that he respects me for being like I am, for maintaining my independence, for not giving up. From a guy like him, that's one of the sweetest things I'd ever heard. Things were going so well, then one year ago, it started. I walked into my living room, a mug of coffee in my hand. And I saw a Victorian funeral carriage stood right there on my rug, complete with two huge proud horses in full livery, adorned with long black plumes on their bridles. They stood perfectly still when the driver, a small bearded man in period costume and a top hat, fidgeted with the reins and peered at me expectantly. Bizarrely, they were far clearer than the, the usual blurry shapes that I could see. I damn near pissed my pants. I dropped the cup spilling scalding hot coffee over my bare feet, jumping backwards with a cry of pain and alarm. When I returned my attention to the horses and carriage back in the room, they were gone. At that moment, I wondered if I, if I was going mad. Apparently most of us do, which is understandable. How would you feel if you'd seen the exact same thing in your home? Unless you're Jack the Ripper, I imagine many of you do not have a coach and horses just lying around. I certainly didn't. Eventually, after much quiet s swearing to myself, and more than a little self-delusion, I managed to convince myself that I had not seen what I thought I had. That it was merely a very vivid daydream. This seemed to work, and I got on with, with living. Even if I entered that same room, a little more cautiously in the days that followed. Finally, I forgot about it. Two weeks later, I saw a giant floating swirling orange ball in my bathroom. I damn near pissed myself again. I stood staring at it, this bizarre rotating, levitating globe that was a little larger than a beach ball. 
hanging in, in midair over my tub, open mouth for a few, for a full ten seconds, before finally screwing my eyelids tightly closed, and whispering to myself, "That isn't there, that isn't there." After five seconds, I opened my eyes again. It wasn't there. Have you ever had cause to doubt your own sanity? To wonder whether you'd perceive it as truly there, or if your mind has betrayed you? Honestly, compared to the loss of my vision, the respect of losing my wits was so much more terrifying. I'd fought against adversity and took pride in the fact that I am not just a survivor, but somebody who is living his own life. How could I do that if I was insane? I barely slept that night, and I remained jumpy for days afterwards. Any sign of movement or any unfamiliar shape would set my pulse racing, would cause me to doubt whether it was truly there. It was the toughest time I'd ever been through. Worse even than that time I was diagnosed with diabetes. At least when Dr. Harper had told me about the diabetes, I had a definite, definitive prognosis. I was given facts by a medical professional. My affliction was physical. It had a name, and most important, it had a treatment plan. This was something else. My own mind had turned against me. My senses and perception of reality had become twisted and unreliable. It's only when you're in that position that you realize just how terrifying it is. Your senses and the way in which your brain interprets them are your only true defenses against danger. You perceive danger and you avoid it, preventing your body from becoming harmed. But what happens if you can't trust your perception to alert you to dangers that are truly there? Lois picked up the problem first, noticing my skittish manner. She asked what was wrong, if I needed to talk about anything, but I told her no, I was fine, but I hadn't been sleeping well. That last part was true. I hadn't been able to sleep a wink. Just the very thought of being institutionalized, spending the rest of my days a sedated blue pajamas clad zombie in a white room with only the echoing cries of my fellow inmates for company, terrified me beyond measure. But what, what was an alternative? Live life as a risk to myself and others? Ultimately, I chose to ignore it. I reasoned that if I was able to function around other people without them realizing what was going on, that was good enough. A full month passed before the next incident, and I really did think that maybe I'd put this whole mess behind me. With every passing day, my confidence had grown, so that Wednesday morning I'd stepped out onto the sunny street, feeling pretty carefree. Each Wednesday, I'd treat myself to a latte down at Joe's. The same coffee shop that I had visited with Lois. It was a custom that gave me a great deal of pleasure. One that had seen me forge friendships with other regulars as well, as the staff, including Joe himself. As I made my way down the street, white, white stick in hand, I glanced about me, taking in the colors and shapes of the world around me. I enjoy the feel of the sun on my face and the sound of the birds singing. It was a good day. Then I saw them. A party of pilgrims, six of them, all dressed in settler-era attire, sitting cross-legged on asphalt. They didn't look at me. It said they were engaged in a heated yet strangely silent conversation. I froze staring at them. Still, they argued. 
gesticulating furiously at one another. However, I couldn't hear their angry voices despite the fact that they must be screaming at one another. Paralyzed by shock, the white stick fell from my numb fingers, clattering on the sidewalk. I turned to leave, desperate to flee from the haunting sight of the colonists on the, in the road. But I was so panicked in such a hurry that I stepped on my cane. It rolled underfoot before I knew it. I, I pitched over, tumbling to, to the hard ground below. I didn't quite break my fall in time, banging my cheek hard on the floor and skinning my palms. I heard a cry from a passerby, a friendly, concerned woman who rushed to my side. She felt she knelt beside me, helping me up, applying a Kleenex to my throbbing cheek, which she informed me was now bleeding. I tried to tell her I was okay, there was nothing to worry about, but this good Samaritan insisted on driving me to Dr. Harper's office to get my injuries looked at. Now I think back to it, I'm pretty sure that she knew my obvious distress was nothing to do with the fall at the time. I was embarrassed and angry, but now I realize I owe her a debt of gratitude. Without her intervention, I don't know how much longer this, this would have gone on before I cracked up and ended up in an asylum after breaking down through sheer stress. Andrew, why don't you tell me what happened? Dr. Harper asked, gently dabbing at my cheek with disinfectant. I explained that I just lost my balance and that, and that no harm was done, but I think he saw through my feeble protestations to my underlying agitation. He didn't press or force the matter. He simply asked what might have caused my clumsiness. Then he asked how I have I'd been as, as of late, and I finished mumbling my way through the most non comedical middle answer I could muster. He placed a gentle, reassuring hand on my shoulder. Andrew, he re repeated gently, why don't you tell me what happened? I burst into tears. I told him how scared I was, how I'd fought so hard for my independence. And now I knew it would be taken from me. He listened patiently and didn't ask me to tell him why I ever thought that. I paused then, took a deep breath, and thought about it. This was the point of no return. But really, what other option did I have? So with tears running down my cheeks, I told Dr. Harper everything. I told him about the horse and carriage, the orange globe, and the pilgrims. I told him how, be, how I'd been living each day in fear, how I was terrified that I was losing my mind. Dr. Harper thought for a while, and then he said, Andrew, I don't think you're losing your mind. The, the sense of relief at the moment was so powerful, it overwhelmed me, rendering, rendering me speechless. You say that even though you've seen these things, you never heard any noise from them? Have you detected any odors or experienced any other physical sensations, such as touching them? I shook my head no, and he patted my shoulder once again. Andrew, have you ever heard of Charles Bonnet Syndrome? He asked. Charles Bonnet who? I asked, confused by this suddenly unexpected turn of conversation. Okay, let me explain. Dr. Harper said kindly. Charles Bonnet was a Swiss naturalist who, is, who was born in the 1700s. He discovered a curious condition in his elderly grandfather, who was nearly completely blind due to cataracts. The old man regularly experienced visual hallucinations, including random patterns and even people and places. Sound familiar? Yes, I replied. Still confused. Am I am am I suffering from dementia? No, Andrew, not at all. Doctor Harper reassured me. Do you know how perception works? 
In Luma's terms, your eyes take in light via the iris and pupil. When it is processed via the retina and translated into electrical signals, which are decoded by the brain, which simply organizes these signals into a recognizable image. With me so far? I nodded, finally, starting to understand. When the retina becomes damaged, such as those that have undergone mass macular degeneration, those signals become warped and jumbled. Dr. Harper went on. The brain still receives them, so it does its job translating those distorted signals into an image. It kind of fills in the gaps for you. Sometimes it fills these gaps with colors, patterns, creatures, and places that aren't present. And this is called Charles Bonnet Syndrome. I nearly wept with relief. So I'm not mad? I cried. Not at all. The doctor replied, this is, this is an entirely physical condition. Your mind is in full working order. If you're suffering from or suffering any form of mental illness, your delusions wouldn't be limited to just the one sense. You would hear these, these interlopers, smell them, even feel them. This is a condition solely related to your eyes, not your brain. As I left Dr. Harper's office, I felt as if a weight had lifted from my shoulders. Sure, my vision was still an issue, but now I knew it was only a problem with my eyes, not my mind. I knew I could handle the situation. I was ready to face the world again. Since then, I had seen plenty of weird visions. I saw a huge waterfall in the park complete with a hazy mist and butterflies flitting about. I saw a Native American warrior, complete with a huge feathery headdress, sitting at a stool at the counter in a coffee shop. I saw an intricate and quite impossible structure of scaffolding crisscrossing the entire front of my apartment block. Hell, on the 4th of July last year, I even saw a, a great swooping green dragon in the sky twisting and comforting through the air overhead. All, all looked utterly and quickly real, yet now I knew they were simple tricks of the eye. They were no longer disturbing. In fact, I actually came to quite enjoy them. Even looking at them as unique and entertaining little shows or works of art that existed purely for my pleasure and nobody else's, I came to welcome them. Then a month ago, I saw her. It was nighttime. It's always nighttime when I see her. And I was getting ready for bed. I walked into the kitchen to get myself a glass of water. And actually cried out in alarm when I spotted the figure in the corner. She was tall, by far the tallest woman I'd ever seen. And even though she stood hunched, she still had at least six inches on me. I was used to seeing characters in dated and bizarre dress. But this was different somehow. It didn't seem like an outfit from any one time. Instead... A bizarre mismatch of items. She wore a tuxedo jacket, figure hugging in black, tailored to the female body shape, over a, a dirty old ruffled dress t shirt. To complete the ensemble, she wore a bright red bow tie. On her hands, she held out to either side as if sh shrugging or maybe feeling for rain. She wore dirty white gloves. Her fingers were disproportionately long, almost spidery, and occasionally they twitched, as if she longed to grip and squeeze something. <laughs> squeeze something in them. On her lower half, she wore shorts, the same crimson as her bro tie. Over her pink black nylons, her legs were long, lithe, attractive. If the truth be told, the legs of a dancer. She also wore red heels, the same hue as her shorts and bow tie, 
but they sparkled and shimmered, bringing to mind Judy Garland's ruby slippers from The Wizard of Oz. As strange as this ensemble was, I couldn't tear my eyes from her face. Most of it was obscured by a jaunty bowler hat, tipped and tilted to hide her eyes and nose. But beneath the brim of her hat, I could see the deathly pale skin of her face and a grin that sh sent shivers down my spine. It was wide, too wide, with entirely too much teeth. A smile is meant to be an expression of warmth. It's meant to feel welcoming and benevolent. The look of the woman's face oozed malice. It felt much like the sort of glee I expect from a snake as it corners a rat. However, the thing that startled me the most was that she had a third arm sprouting from her back, curled up and over her head like a scorpion's tail. It was longer than any arm should be, and the hand only had three fingers, like a claw. It was pointed straight at me, and I, as I swore in dismay and stumbled sideways, it seemed to track my movement. I stood staring at the creepy figure for a few seconds, trying to get my head around the situation. She just stood there in the corner, grinning back. Finally, I realized that this was just another of my hallucinations. I breathed an audible sigh of relief. One of the tricks I've picked up over the months of suffering from Charles Bonnet Syndrome is to break the line of vision toward whichever stimulus is causing my brain to interpret the images into the hallucination. I think it's like restarting a faulty computer. How ref refreshing the system debugs it. To this end, I close my eyes and count it to five. Then when I reopen them, the hallucination is gone. So, as I stared at the horrified malformed figure in my kitchen, I knew that I had to make the image go away. I simply had to close my eyes. I'll be honest here, when I counted to five, I hesitated a little before opening my eyes. If I opened my eyes and she had stuck still been stood there, smiling that wicked smile at me. I think I might have had a heart attack. She wasn't, and I breathed another long sigh of relief. I fetched my glass of water and went back to bed. The tall woman haunted my thoughts in the days after I saw her. She was different from the other visions I had. Somehow she felt more real. It was this agitation that my buddy Jason picked up on when we met up for lunch the following Friday. Jason was one of the, those same friends I tried to drive away shortly after I lost my vision, yet he refused to give up on me, continuing to get in touch week after week. Good friends are hard to come by, but great friends, the ones who will be by your side for life, are even rarer. Jason... God bless his kind heart, is one of the latter. You got to tell me what's going on, dude, he said as we sat down over pizza. What do you mean? I asked, trying to brush it off. You're so distracted. It's like you've been looking for something in here all the time. You're eating like one slice and pizza, uh, one slice of pizza in the time it's taking me to eat four. So I repeat, you've got to tell me what's going on. Jesus said, waving a slice of pizza around for emphasis. It's nothing. I replied to feeling a little stupid. I just had a hallucination a couple nights ago that really got to me. I thought you were cool with these now, he asked, putting the pizza slice down. Yeah, I, I am. I mean, I was, but this was different. I replied... We signed to talking about it. She, she scared me. She? Jason asked. His interest clearly peaked. Tell me about it. So I did. 
I described the tall woman and how she had appeared to me. I explained it unlike any of my other hallucinations. She felt more real. Now she was the first to feature such a weird and unsettling mutation. Sure, I'd seen versions of people in the past. But the extra appendage is a possibly distorted face for something I had yet to encounter thus far. I think it was that combined with the unnerving expectant stance that had disturbed me the most. So? Jason said after I finished. You said she had great legs? Shut up, you asshole. I laughed, throwing my napkin at him. No, seriously, I get it, man. Jason replied, passing the napkin back to me. If I walked in a room and a giant mutant was waiting for me, it scared the shit out of me, too. But you know what caused you to see this? It's like the coachman in that waterfall you saw. It's the condition that you know you have, and it's the one that you know you have to deal with, okay? I know, I know, I replied. Thanks, man. You're right. It did feel better, too, so I smiled at him, took a big bite of my pizza, and changed the subject, asking him about his psycho ex, a conversation he was all, all too happy to dive into. The next time I saw the tall woman, just under a week later, I was brushing my teeth. I was stood at the wash basin, brushing away when I spotted a figure in the window uh, in the mirror. She was out in the dark hallway, peeking around the door behind me. The same sinister grin I'd seen before stretched her narrow face into the distorted grimace. The dirty bowler hat pushed down over her eyes once again. Each of those three long spiderly hands gripped the door frame. As crazy as it sounds... It felt like she was trying to avoid being spotted. I cried out, spitting toothpaste foam all over the mirror. My toothbrush clattering into the basin. I spun around, my heart thumping in my chest. My breathing ragged in my throat. She wasn't there, of course. She wasn't. The doorway was empty. I tiptoed forward, hesitantly trying to look around. The door frame into the hallway without actually sticking my neck out into its shadowy confines. The seconds ticked by as I drew closer and closer. I couldn't see anything, so finally, with a whisper of self-affirmation, I stepped out of the bathroom. The hallway was empty, as was the rest of my apartment. I was shaken again. This wasn't the first time. I'd seen a hallucination and a reflection, and wasn't even sure that I'd actually seen it. Now, as I sit here writing this, knowing what would follow, I think I thought like that to try to protect myself, to shield myself from the truth. I was an idiot. A full fortnight passed. Without incident, sure, I saw a flash of color one day, a dancing yellow lightning bolt that zigzagged back and forth on the street outside, the pa my, pa outside my apartment. But that wasn't exactly the sort of thing I'd come to expect from my condition. It was exciting, otherworldly, but it wasn't scary, not like she was. In retrospect, that fortnight was blissful. It was a reminder of what life could be like. The existence that I, I had carved out for myself since my diagnosis. Life was good. The night had changed the way I viewed the tall woman. Last night, I had been out and had a couple of drinks. I would met the other guys with visual impairment for dinner. And we ended up at a bar afterwards. 
I wasn't hammered, but we got through plenty of beer between us. And by the time I stepped out into the cool night air, I felt decidedly light-headed. It took me a while to make it home, laughing and talking to a couple of other guys from our group as we strolled along. It had been a great evening. It's probably the last truly good one I'll ever have. I bid the other guys good night and and fumbling with my key, let myself in. With swaying steps, I strolled into my hallway, slamming the door a little too loudly behind me. I took off my jacket, hung it on the hook by the door, and then hit the light switch. She was waiting at the end of the hallway, all three hands held aloft into claws, reaching out for me, and saying maddening malevolent grin on her pale face. I swore again louder than ever, actually jumping back a step. Recalling from the impossibly tall and terrifying figure lying in wait in my own home. The tall woman didn't move. She just stood there, sta staring and smiling at me. I stared back, but I was by sure as hell didn't smile. Jesus Christ, I muttered under my breath. You know how you can feel a little paranoid after a few beers? That feeling of non-specific post-alcohol dread. Imagine that combined with the giant grinning mutant woman suddenly appearing in your home. Suffice it to say... It was a very, very, it, it was very, very, very uncool. I don't need this. I sighed and closed my eyes. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. When I opened my eyes, her face was just a foot from my own, grinning Wider than ever. She dashed the length of the hallway and it was now stood so close that her long grasping arms were either side of me, her fingers twitching and clawing at the air around my face. I could see her chest heaving as if, as if she were actually laughing silently at my attempts to dismiss her, as if the thought that I could ever be free of her was amusing. I screamed a full-bodied shriek of, hor of terror and actually dropped to my knees, covering my head as if to fend it off an unexpected blow. It never came. Finally, I lowered my hands, grasping for breath, shaking. The hallway was, was empty, a tall one nowhere to be seen. I stayed there on my knees for a moment, gasping for breath. Then I was on my feet, and I turned and ran out of the apartment, out of the building and into the street. I stood there shivering, terrified beyond reason, without a clue as to what I'd do next. Finally, I pulled my phone from my pocket, and I made a phone call. Hey, Andy, what's up? Jason asked. Jason, I, I need you to come here. I said, sobbing. Jason didn't ask why, didn't complain. Instead, he simply replied, I'm on my way. Less than 20 minutes later, his car pulled up outside, and he dashed over to the steps outside my building, where I was sitting, shivering. He threw his jacket around my shoulders and asked what happened. His voice filled with concern. She, she's in there, I stammered. The tall woman, she's back. Okay, okay, he said, gently helping me to my feet. Come on, man. Let's go in there and check it out. I wish I could say that I was brave when we went inside. But I'd be lying. I cowered behind Jason, one hand on his shoulder, as he made our way through my home. Of course, we didn't find a thing. We're talking a giant mutant woman in a 
cookie little one bed apartment? Where the hell is she going to hide? Finally, after we checked every single room twice, I admit that she was gone. I I'm so sorry, man. I apologize. I'm feeling generally stupid. I got scared and I I'm sorry, man. Hey, forget about it, buddy. Jesus said, so I I'm here now. Where do you keep your booze? Half a bottle of bourbon lighter. We were both feeling pretty talkative. She's, you know, just kind of different, you know? I tried to explain. I get it, I get it, he said. It's like you saw something bad and you feel bad and that's bad. He didn't get it. No, she's different, you know. I explained. I've never had a repeat hallucination before. And they've never been scary, you know? She's not like the others. Dude, Jason said, talk, taking another sip of bourbon. You've got, like, Charlie Bonnie syndrome. And you know that makes you see shit. So, he waved his hands in the air like a magician who just performed the trick. I know, I know. I replied. No, listen. He, he said. You know, it makes you see shit. It's just your eyes, yeah? You didn't hear anything. You didn't feel anything. This is just how that stuff goes. It's your eyes, and I know it's scary, man. But you've been through, like, hell and high water for in your life so far. You're tough. One of the toughest, bravest guys I know. And you can handle some creepy hallucination, bitch. I laughed. I couldn't help it. She is a very creepy hallucination bitch, though, dude. He laughed, too, and we both took a drink. You know, that could help. He said finally in his voice, thoughtful. What? Drinking? I asked. No, well, yes, it does. He giggled. I mean, demystifying her. She'd give her a name, something stupid, so she's not scared. I have to say that, that as much as I like creepy hallucination, bitch. That's a bit of a mouthful. I laughed. Yeah, yeah, I get that. He replied. Something he, he said came back to me. How about Helen? I suggested. Helen Highwater. Awesome, he said, then raised his glass. Here's to Helen, buddy. To Helen, I smiled and drained my glass. Jason spent the night on my sofa, mainly because he had too much to drink, to even think about getting behind the wheel of a vehicle. But honestly, I think the reason he drank so much was so he'd have an excuse to stay and keep an eye on me. I'm glad he did. Knowing that he was there made me feel safer, and I was able to get some sleep. It gave me a sense of security. To know that if the strange hallucination I just christened Helen was to appear again, I'll be able to call on him for support. This morning, we both need support. It feels like a mule kicked me in the head, he groaned when I made my way into the living room. Yep, I replied, my own head thumping. Joe's? Joe's, he replied firmly and staggered to his feet as he drank strong black coffee and ate muffins. We didn't talk much. Finally, Jason broke the silence. So you feel cool now? He asked, his mouth still full of, of blueberry muffin. I nodded. Yeah, I think so. You're still not freaked about, out about you-know-who? He asked, Helen. I replied with a smile. No, I don't. I really don't think I am. Or I'm gonna handle some creepy hallucination, bitch. Good. He laughed, giving me a hearty pat on the back. That's cool, man. I bet you can. Now, as I sit here, cowering in my bathroom, too scared to go out into my apartment, I know we were both wrong about everything.
remember how earlier I told you about the thought of being institutionalized? The very idea of losing my grasp on reality was the most terrifying thing I could imagine. Now I'd welcome that, because the alternative is far, far worse. After breakfast, I said goodbye to Jason, and he climbed into his car and drove away. Days passed without incident, and when Lois stopped by this afternoon, she even commented on how upbeat I seemed. You got a lady in your life? She asked casually. I laughed at that, wondering what she'd think if she knew the truth. Yeah. I chuckled. Something like that. Good for you, she sniffed. You make sure to treat her right. That tickled me even more, and I had to bite my lip. Sure, I replied. I'll do my best. Tonight, still a little wiped from the ex exertions of the previous evening, I decided to turn in early. I brushed my teeth, washed my hands and face, and got changed. Finally, I fetched a glass of water and walked into my bed, my bedroom. I climbed into bed and instantly felt so, so relaxed. Within mere seconds, I was ready for sleep. That sudden overwhelming drowsiness that comes when you've spent a whole day keeping sleep at bay. I decided that resistance was futile and sat up to switch off the light. I nearly didn't see her, but as I reached for the switch, I caught a glimpse of something out of the corner of my eye. My heart leaped into my throat as I turned to the foot of my bed. The tall woman was crouching there, her grinning face staring at me from just beyond my feet, so many teeth. Her long, slender fingers spreading out over my blankets, twitching slightly as she gripped the end of the bed. Slowly, excruciatingly so, her third mishapen, mishapen arm came into view of her shoulder, joining her other hands onto my bedding. I froze, utterly petrified. I was at crossroads here, arriving at a pivotal moment that had been coming for some time. But this time, I've had enough. You don't scare me anymore. I said, my voice filled with defiance and anger. I'm not letting you do this to me. I reached across to the light switch. Good night, Helen. I said triumphantly, then flicked it, plunging the room into darkness. I laid there, a sense of tremendous pride surging through me, and I grinned to myself in my warm, comfortable bed. Overjoyed at the emotional victory of overcoming my own fear. And then it happened. The thing that led me here. Something that turned my blood to ice water. And my bowels to jelly. Good night, Andrew. Her raspy voice hissed from the darkness. And that's it. That's it? Yep. The end is they find out he's not a hallucination. <laughs> That's just how it ends. Oh my god. Hey. Hey. All right, so I'm going to be right back. I have to take a piss. All right. Uh, Jerry, entertain the stream. Bookworm, what do you think of the story Brad just read? Well, you do if you saw something like Helen Highwater or whatever her name actually is and then found out she was real.
Yeah, I don't blame you for not being sure. After all, it's kind of hard to imagine someone that has a third arm that's kind of like a scorpion tail. How's your day been? And I'm back. All right, welcome back.
I thought... I, I just realized we're going through these stories a lot quicker than I thought, so I grabbed two more. Alright. And this was in the popular tag called The Theater. Everyone ready? To hear about the, the theater? Uh, I guess let's let's hear it. Yeah, I guess uh, <laughs> I'm not hearing anything else. All right, then let's go. Three, two, one. The theater. Have you ever heard of an old PC game called The Theater? Yeah, I didn't think so. Probably because many people say it doesn't even exist. You see, The Theater is an old computer game. Released around the same time as Doom. Today, if you ever find it, it's only available on crappy bootleg CD-ROMs which more often than not don't even actually contain the game. The actual legitimate copies that they say were released back in the day feature a black cover with nothing but the sprite of what has since been named the Ticket Taker. He is a simply poorly drawn pixelated Caucasian bald man with large red lips wearing a red vest over a white shirt and black pants. He is completely emotionless. Though some say that if you smash the disc in it, his face is shown as angry the next time you look at the cover. But this is just dismissed as urban myth. What is peculiar about the theater, though, is that there is no developer named on the jewel case nor a game description on the back. It is simply the ticket taker on a white backdrop on both sides. The game was initially shown... Oh, wait, hold on. Hold on, I gotta do something real quick. Downloads. Because apparently they included one picture for the story. And let me just... Sorry about this. Hey, right, there we go. Now it's the background. <laughs> Anyways. The game was initially known for its inability to install correctly. The ins installation process immediately locks up the computer when a user reaches the licensing agreement. Also, strange about the licensing agreement for the theater is that whenever the development studio is supposed to be named, the text is simply a blank line. Anyways, most people who have claimed to own one of the original CDs say that they figured out how to install the game by simply rebooting their computer on the licensing agreement with the disc still inside. Then they are prompted to press I agree on startup, then they continue with the installation. The game then starts up without any introduction besides a main menu that is simply the sprite of a movie theater's exterior on an empty city street. The title fades in and then the three menu buttons, new game, load, options. Selecting options immediately crashes the game to the desktop. Notice that not to function at all, even if you do not have a saved game. Even if you have, do have a saved game. Nothing happens when you press it, 
Thus, new game is the only working menu option. Once it is selected, you are the first. You are in first-person view. You are standing in an empty movie theater lobby, with the exception of the ticket taker, standing in the front of a dark hallway, which one can only assume leads to the theaters themselves. There's nothing to do but look at the poorly drawn, mostly illegible movie posters, or approach the ticket taker. Once the player moves towards the ticket taker, a very low quality sound clip plays, saying, Thank you, please enjoy the movie. Along with a speech box saying the same thing. When you walk into the hallway, the screen fades to black, and you're back in the empty lobby, and you do the exact thing again and again and again. While well, this may sound like a really horrible game, a number of peculiar things occur as you continue to play it. The number of times you have to continue into the hall after giving your ticket to ticket taker before the strange events ha happen is unknown. Most state is completely random and could take anywhere from the first playthrough to the four 400th. What happens though has deeply disturbed some players. The first occurrence is when the player face fades back. In after walking into the hallway, this time they will notice the ticket taker is completely absent. The player then, without any other options, decides to walk into the dark hallway. The sound clip and text mentioned previously still play in the absence of the ticket taker. But when the player walks into the hallways, the screen does not fade out. It goes pitch black as they walk deeper into the hall, but the player's footstep sound clip is still playing as they continue to push the up button on their keyboard. Those claiming to have played the original game report to have felt extremely uncomfortable walking down the hallway, anticipating the whole way something horrible happening. While eventually the player is unable to move forward, there is nothing for a few moments before a strange sprite that is described as a ticket taker, but with a swirl or a face appears and stands before the player. The original players of the game say their bodies immediately froze up and their stomachs churned when they saw the sprite. Nothing happens as a swirl swirly headman stands before them. Then suddenly a piercing screech plays as the game glitches out. This lasts for a few minutes with the screeching becoming continuous. Then the player is abruptly returned to the lobby with all the sounds and graphics being as they should be. <laughs> and the game continues normally for the next couple of cycles of entering the hallway with a couple of original players claiming the swirly head man would briefly appear and disappear in the corner of the screen as a brisk yelp sound effect plays. Then at some point after meeting swirly head man, the player sees a ticket taker pacing back and forth, though there's no walking animation. The sprite's limbs are completely static, so he just hops up and down slightly as a substitute. With his eyes being wide and his mouth open to simulate a worried facial expression. Some players noted that the movie posters have been replaced with images of the swirly head man, which caused them to immediately turn their character's head away. From the posters and approach the ticket taker. Then another different low quality sound clip plays, but the speech box contains nothing but corrupted characters that cause whatever text that would have been in a box to be completely illegible. Due to the extremely low quality of the sound, it is debated by the players what exactly the ticket taker says at this point, though it is widely agreed. That he says, never reach the other levels. Then the screen fades out once again and returns the player back to their starting point in the lobby. But the ticket taker is gone and the hallway is blocked by a large brick wall sprite. Touching the brick wall will immediately crash the game. And that's all there is to it. No one knows what the other levels are or how to gain access to them. 
nor is it known what, why the swirly head man causes such acute fear in those who have seen him in the game. All the original copies of the theater have either been lost or destroyed. But the creepiest part is the fact that that is that all the original players of the game claim to occasionally see a brief glimpse of the swirly head man out of the corner of their eyes. And that's it. That's the theater. Uh, are you saying something, Jerry? No. Oh. <laughs> what does everyone think about the theater? What do you think, Cherry? My brain recently wiped itself out, so I basically don't remember any of it, I'll be honest. <laughs> like, when my brain does that, typically, it's in the middle of a conversation, so I can pick some information up and continue, like, figuring out the conversation. But in a story, when it does that, it, you can't really do that, so. Yeah. Bookworm, that's not quite the same. That just sounds like you partially paid attention. Here we go. Anyways, everyone ready for the next game? Uh, next game, not next game, next story. Why did I say game? The next story. This is a long title. Does anyone remember the rhyme about the patchwork man and the picture game? The hell is that? <laughs> it's it's the title. Never even heard of that. It was made recently, May thirty first, twenty twenty four. Oh. 
Anyways, let's continue with the story. Patchwork man, patchwork man, play a game. Patchwork man, patchwork man, in the frame. And the next line is something about stealing your skin. But for the life of me, I cannot remember the end. I'm trying to find it for an old friend. This friend, for privacy's sake, let's call her Kayla. Met me for a coffee after texting me out of the blue. Reminiscing about our childhood days and wondering if we could get together and catch up. I'm one of the few who stayed in our hometown and never moved. Even though there's really nothing except for lots of conifers reaching up towards the clouds like bushes painting the skies a permanent gray. The trees and slopes mean our roads are winding, our homes are sh our homes shaded, and the sky blotted out by branches unless you're willing to drive far enough to where the land levels into p pasture. All of which is to say, our sleepy town has its share of quirks, and it's possible the game never caught on in other places. When Kayla mentioned it in her text to me, memories flooded back. I hadn't thought about elementary school in years. Suddenly, I was back on the playground, running across the sand, screaming because Kayla wouldn't stop trying to kiss me, pretending to be Pepe Le Pew while I pretended to be the cat. To be honest, I barely remember Kayla aside from that memory. Even though we attended the same school all the way through senior year, she became one of the popular girls. And since I turned out to be the token gay, I spent most of high school just trying to figure, just trying to keep my head down and get through. We met at a small cafe. One of the only two breakfast spots in town, and the only one with coffee I considered decent. Seated by the large windows, I wondered if I'd even recognize her. I texted that I was wearing a, gay, a gray flannel. When she came in, she looked around for a moment in confusion, spotted my shirt and beamed. Pat, almost didn't know it was you. Kayla? I smiled and stood up. I definitely didn't recognize you. Wow, you look like a real city gal. It's such a beautiful coat. It's Burberry, she said and blushed embarrassed. Maybe to be a rich woman in such a homey space. I like your tattoo. Is that a wolf? It's actually my husky, Snowy. Named him when I was eight. I never wanted to forget him so. Oh my god, it is so sweet. She laid a hand to my heart, looking gently touched as she slid into my seat. I never knew you had a dog. How did I not know that? You know, my son recently got a dog. You got kids now? I've got kids now. The first half hour of catching up, Kayla was smiling, energetic, and seemingly delighted to share about her life and ask about mine, and yet I noticed the occasional drift of her eyes as I was telling her about my dad's health, like she was distracted, like all this sunny conversation was just light on the water's surface, just deeper down, a darker undercurrent tugged her thoughts elsewhere, like she was itching to ask me something, but then she, then she smiled, but then the smile returned, as carefully applied as her makeup. I suppose life as a businesswoman taught her to wear that myable disposition, just like that expensive coat. But I'm patient. I kept up the discussion and waited for her to get comfortable. Enough to shed both the fancy coat and fancy smile. Explain to me why her hands were trembling. Finally, she sipped her coffee and asked, do you remember Jimmy Smith?
Of course I remember Jiminy Smith. That was how we always re refer to him. Not as Jimmy, like back when he was alive. Jimmy Smith. First name, last name, Jimmy Smith, the boy who went missing. You remember what he looked like? She asked. It took me aback. I tried to think that far into the past, shook my head, and reached into her bag and pulled out a photograph. An actual printed photograph. This was a lot of effort. I looked at the photo and tried to remember him. Blue eyes, blonde hair. Chubby red cheeks, and that mole on his nose. Jimmy Smith was, the, was in our fourth grade class when he went missing. People searched for weeks, but there was no trace of him anywhere. You remember, she asked, how mad the sheriff got about the patchwork man? I remember, I nodded. They thought he was someone they could find. The Patchwork Man was like our small town's version of the Boogeyman, or Bloody Mary. A scary tale we use to spook one another. He wasn't real, but Jimmy talked about him so much in the days before he disappeared that authorities assumed he was an actual person stalking us all. It's possible the other kids said stuff that led them to think that too. And Jimmy was- and the others drew pictures of him. So many pictures. A disfigured man in a patchwork calico coat. But I was never really all that into the fads and games that the other children got swept up in. I didn't learn about the patchwork man until our school field trip to an art museum. Our school was so small, it was us little kids plus all the older kids. When we finally got to the museum, all us and our kids were spilling into the rooms and wandering among the paintings, pointing and saying things like, Oh my god, it's Patrick Man! Sometimes we pointed at creepy figures or characters in molted clothes like jesters. But mostly we pointed at paintings where there wasn't any figure at all. The other kids didn't get in and kept asking, What's the Patrick Man? I didn't really get it either, even though I kept doing it. But then Jimmy explained it to me. The picture game was kind of like a cross between Where's Waldo and those magic eye things. The idea was that you had to try and find the Patrick Man. Most of the kids were pretending just like I was. He's right behind you, we'd say. He's gonna snatch you away. Stuff like that. The teachers told, finally told us to quit it, but for weeks after, every so often, someone would remember and start it up again, shrieking that they saw the Patrick Man. They yell and point at a picture and swear they saw it for real, and that he was in the picture. Guys, I swear he was there. The week before Jimmy Smith went missing, he said it a lot. There was a rhyme too, Hala insisted. Do you remember? Uh, do you remember we chanted it to scare him off? She began to chant, "Patchwork man, Patrick man, play a game." I joined in. The words tumbling up from some dusty shelf of memory. Patrick man, Patrick man, in the frame. Patrick man, I can't remember the rest. Yes, it's for I'm stuck too. She struck the table with a flat of her hand, tried to lift her cup, but her fingers were shaking too bad. And then something about stealing skins, and the last line was how to get rid of him. Stealing, stealing skins. I'd forgotten about that until she mentioned it. How the patchwork man stole the skins of its victims, and his own body was sewn together from their pieces, so that he had the eyes of one and no the nose of another patchwork man i tapped my finger to my head trying to recall the rest of it damn 
That's gonna bother me. You didn't have to, didn't have to have it written down. Maybe do it in an old book or something. Doubt it. She shook her head. We destroyed all the pictures and books too. Everything. That night. You remember that night after Jimmy disappeared? We all met at Roger's house for the bonfire. Oh, you're right. Shit, I forgot you're right. We threw in our notebooks. Not just our notebooks, everything. Pictures we drew, pictures we stole from our parents' houses. Even some of the paintings. And the book. You remember Jimmy's book? Jimmy's book. Now that she said it, I can almost picture us all scattered around the library. Kayla at the girly girl's table with Nancy Drew books. Me lounging over a beanbag chair with Snoopy comics. And Jimmy suddenly exclaiming from a corner table. He had one of those magic eye books with the patterns where you, you have to cross your eye a little to see a hidden picture. And he shouted, It's him! It's him! I found the Patrick man! Everyone crowded around his table to look at the magic eye book. There was a chorus of, I don't see anything, and where? A girl named Cindy declared she could see him. Well, she was clearly in line because she couldn't even point where in the picture he was. And Kayla, back then with her freckled face and unkept hair and perpetually skinned knees from roller skating, she squinted hard at the page and said, I see him too, a man standing in the corner. Now, in the diner, Kayla reached into her bag and pulled out a book. He's in here. She said, pushing it towards me. Ice trick trickled down my spine. It was a magic eye book, the same book. Different copy, but identical cover and pages. Why would you? Tell me I'm not crazy. Tell me he's not there. I, I sighed, but I opened the book. You know, I've never been good at these things. I don't think I'll be able to see anything in any of them. You can. I'll show you said Kayla, impatiently but insistently taught me how to look. How to see the ball in the picture on the first page, the airplane on the second. It was difficult. I could only make out the shapes with intense concentration. But after I saw a star without her giving me hints, she nodded encouragement and turned the page. The next one was challenging. In fact, the longer I stared, the more convinced I became there was nothing in the picture at all. That this one was a dud. Sweat formed my, on my brow. I could feel the moisture pulling under my ar armpits. Even as my skin went cold. Wait. Maybe there was something. I think I see a figure. I said finally. Sort of. It's crystal clear to me when I look. She closed the book without looking at the page. That one's the patchwork man. Oh. I said, felt a tingle of unease, but then I thought about it for a moment. Could be any man-shaped figure, though, couldn't it? We all made up all that stuff about the Patrick man. It was just a game. But she was pulling more things out of her bag now. Spilling the bag open to reveal photos, articles, artwork. She shoved a handful of paper newspaper clippings that toward me. Here, in this town. She said, voice low and, and tremulous. The experience started along before Jimmy, and after him, there was a boy the next year in the second grade, and later, a little immigrant girl. The experience happened every decade or so. A handful of people and then nothing for years. And now her composure completely cracked. She took her napkin and held it to her face, her mouth trembling beneath falling tears as she was buying back a scream. Finally, she burst. I didn't mean to look. I was going through my old notebooks. Childhood stuff I'd packed away, and I found some diary entries I wrote about the Patrick man. She started to sob. I should have burned it. I must have forgot it. I thought if I did burn it. Once I saw my old drawings of him, I, I see him everywhere now. He, he won't go away. He's real. He has Jimmy Blue's eyes. Jimmy's rosy cheek. Look, look, you can see. I don't want to, I said. But she shoved Jimmy's photo over along with a folder of artwork. And in spite of myself, I looked. 
The folder contained printouts of paintings, the kind you might see in people's houses or in a museum. Initially, they were all perfectly ordinary pictures. I... I shouldered my head and told her there was nothing in them, but then... I almost missed him. My eyes wanted to skip over him, but the feel of goosebumps on my arms made me look again. And there in a watercolor of a crowded street, amongst all the shades bleeding together like wet ink after a rain, was a man wearing a patchwork coat made of some sort of supple, delicate leather. He was gone in the next few paintings, but reappeared in another, another impressionistic crowd scene. And the more images I saw him in, the easier he was to spot, hiding among the artworks like Waldo in the crowd. And I swallowed, trying to quell the fear that brought my heartbeat pounding in my ears, because I could see him clearly enough now to identify the one br bright bl blue eye and ruddy cheek. It really was Jimmy's eye. And up close, the pieces of Jimmy and others, and the patchwork man, were all the wrong size, mismatched, like some sort of Frankenstein, but even more horrifying to look at. In fact, the longer I looked, the more nauseating the details, like how the patchwork man had too many fingers on his hands, and one of his ears was upside down. The other eye had two different pupils, and the buttons on his coat, coat were teeth, and I was getting sick to my stomach. Dizzy, like I was feeling a sense of vertigo. Like when you look at one of those spinning spirals, and when you stop, everything keeps spinning. Like I was staring at a magic eye, and the patterns were shifting. The skin was almost like those memorizing patterns. Wham! I jumped. Kayla had slammed the folder closed, and was shouting at me, hollering at the top of her lungs, shaking me. Stop looking! Stop looking! Everyone in the cafe was staring. I stammered an apology, and we paid and quickly left. Are you okay? She asked. Yeah, yeah, I know, actually. I turned to her. Why the fuck would you come all the way out here and drag me into? Because I don't want to be next. She cried anguish. Rory is starting elementary school. I just need to know the rhyme. Pet, I need to know how it ends. You're the only person I know who might remember. Please, please, what did we do to chase him away at the bonfire? Okay. I crowd, trying to suppress the bubbling fear that no, no, I would not succumb to this, this delusion. She doctored those pictures. She had to, or she'd drawn me into her crazy fears through sheer conviction. But I couldn't leave her in this state, so I said, Okay, I maybe have an idea. We parted a ways and agreed to meet at my house. Later that evening, in the meantime, I looked at the artworks that hung on the walls of my house. Artworks that had been there since my grandparents' generation. Showing landscapes and people all normal. I typed this post thinking if we didn't solve our problem, maybe someone else would help. I was still typing when the doorbell rang. Evening had come sooner than I expected. I met Kayla outside by the fire pit. She had brought her folders with pictures. I also brought a painting out from inside. It was my favorite, a landscape of the beautiful woods and slate gray sky. It seemed to embody the essence of this place. The lonely lo isolation, desolate beauty. But while typing, I reluctantly had to admit, I started catching odd glimpses in the corner of my eye, as if someone was peeking out from behind a trunk. I didn't want that idea to take root any deeper than it had already. The painting had to go. The plan was simple. We'd burn the pictures, recite the rhyme, and hoping that reenacting what we had done as children would jog our memories. I got the fire going while Kayla stood there, tight-lipped and pale. She removed her makeup now and her skin was shallow, and her freckled cheeks sunken with fear. She kept whispering, Patrick man, Patrick man, trying to remember the rhyme I knew. 
But without her knowing the rest, it sounded almost like she was calling him. Hey, I nudged her and began tossing some of the pictures from her folder into the roaring fire. She nodded and followed suit. Throwing her old diary on and in the magic eye book, no one was left of her folder. And lastly, I ripped my painting out of its frame and broke it into two and threw the canvas on. By all of that was catching. Nearly smothering the fire, we faced each other and held hands. It felt awkward and ridiculous. Two adults chanting like children, but we did it anyway. Patrick man, Patrick man, play a game. Patrick man, Patrick man, in the frame. Patrick man, I see you, looking for some skins to steal. Kayla shouted, triumphant, remembering the third line. Just one more. Patrick man, can't take mine, you. But even the line came back to me. She stopped turning her head. She was sta staring at something. You're not supposed to look away from one another during a chant. You're not supposed to look at the fire. But her head was turned, mouth hanging open. Eyes wide in terror, I followed her gaze and... It was impossible, but I swear to you, there on top of the heap was my painting of, of the converse. The edges were starting to catch. The Patrick man was stepping out from the trees, and it was coming out of the painting. That piercing blue eye that used to be Jimmy's fixed on Kayla. The world seemed to swirl and ripple, everything flattening out. Kayla flattening out too. She had her hands at her face, like the character painted in the screen. Patrick Mann's misshapen hands, one large and one small. The fingers all different lengths and wrong, like how his left hand had two thumbs. Grabbed her, grabbed her and drew her in, and they both seemed to blend with brush strokes, strokes and ash and flames, and then the canvas was burning. The pain was gone, and there was no one standing where Kayla had been. Just the prints from her shoes in the dirt. I gapped, disbelieving, stood there in a daze, while the fire slowly died. Not accepting any of what I had seen. How could I? It had been some sort of kind of nightmare. That was the only thing that made sense. I was having a waking nightmare. Maybe someone spiked my drink. I don't know. I don't know. But when I got inside, I looked at the wall, living room, and groaned because there was a small family portrait. A painting of my grandmother. Of my grandfather. A painting by my grandmother of my grandfather. Now, instead of my grandfather, it showed the Patrick man with a patch, new patch of freckled skin on his cheek. And I was for myself the rhyme. The one Kayla didn't finish. Patrick man, Patrick man, play a game. Patrick man, Patrick man, in the frame. Patrick Man, I see you. Looking for some skins to steal. Patrick Man, you can't take mine. You know why? Because you're not real. But I know now that rhyming won't help me. The rhyme just tells you the rule. That if he's not real, he can't hurt you. If he's not real, you don't believe in him. But I think it's too late because I can see him so clearly now. Even now as I finish typing this post. No, for anyone reading this, you don't make the mistake I did. If your kids talk about him, please convince them he's not real. It's not too late for them, as long as you can convince them. My ho only hope now is to drink myself to oblivion, sleep it off, try to convince myself when I wake up that it was all a fever dream. That Kayla never con contacted me. I already deleted all of her messages. And none of this happened. I just have to make myself believe it didn't happen. Patrick man, Patrick, Patrick man, play a game. Patrick man, Patrick man, in the frame. Patrick man, I see you looking for some skins to steal. Patrick man, you can't take mine. You know why? Because you're not real. And that's it. So... The girl was so scared that she got her other friend involved and then ended up dying anyway and ended up do dooming her own friend. So you can tell Danger News that Patrick Man isn't real. That's. that's. Oh. <laughs>
That was technically what you're supposed to say, but that's... Oh my god. <laughs> Bookworm's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Bookworm, you aren't dead. <laughs> uh, yeah, Jerry, you weren't here on yesterday's stream. Um, the creator and director of uh Freddy Krueger died in 2015. Oh. Yeah, we okay. talked about it. Yeah. Also, I would like to say. That is actually a very, very old, like, thing in mythology for certain beings to not be able to do anything unless you believe in them. For, like, positive entities, it might be things like fae or things like that. For negative entities, it might be things like fae, the boogeyman, and other stuff. So... This is actually something older than Freddy Krueger. The idea of it can't hurt you yeah. unless you believe in it. Yeah, also I just realized where I had the book. It's a perfect spot, but it also, if you look at it closely, it kind of looks like I'm not wearing anything. <laughs> Waist <It's> down. <laughs> Anyways, that was not actually a bad one. It was a short one, but it was actually kind of good. No, I, I can see the end of your shorts. Oh, I didn't see that at first. Can't see him now. But also, I can see your legs. You have legs. <laughs> oh my god, Puck. <laughs> Anyways. Everyone ready for the next story? Sure. All right. The next story is Turn It Off. Turn it off. I rested my arms behind my head, skim reading the credits of a movie I just watched. After seeing them through about halfway, I lifted myself from the sofa and walked to the kitchen. Stretching my arms out above me, I opened the fridge door and found a full carton of juice. So I sat down on the kitchen counter by the window. Cracked open the lid and took several long, noisy gulps. When I couldn't drink any more, I gasped to let in new air and wiped my mouth on the back of my mind of my hand. My evenings were uneventful around this time in summer. It was 9.15 p.m. on a Saturday in July. School was out for the holidays, and my parents had gone to visit my aunt and uncle, who lived by the coast. They would be, they would still be gone for two more weeks. I declined an invitation to join them. I didn't dislike the place or my relatives, but we usually stayed there so long that I miss most of my summer break. And I think, and I truthfully rather spend it, uh, truthfully rather spend it with my friends in town. I was a good kid who knew how to wash clothes and use an oven, and generally not an idiot. So they let me stay at the house so long as I kept it clean. As I sat 
as I sat, I looked up into the garden to check for anything scary in the dark. It was empty and black. I kind of wish we had a pet, a dog, or a cat. Would be nice about now. But their hair always made me sneeze and my eyes go red and itchy. With that in my mind, my dad said no, even though I wouldn't mind it. 9.22 p.m. I put the rest of the juice carton back in the fridge door and went back over to the window. Forcing myself onto the counter again, I glanced out to the garden and identified the shadows one by one to make sure everything was in its place. The bushes were their usual shape. Two small, tree, small trees stood together by the back fence and a middle table with four chairs sat casually on the patio. I like to check these things, which I which is largely why I wasn't scared of the dark. I would always get up to investigate small noises in the night, and I hated sleeping with my face to the wall. If someone was in my room at night, I'd rather know about it, so at least there was the faintest chance of getting away somehow. This meant that my worries were quickly put to rest, as I either found nothing downstairs, with the radiator piping with the heat, or, op or opened my eyes to see an empty bedroom, not knowing what could be making the odd noises coming from the kitchen, or on the stairs, or in my room, is what makes my skin creep. 9.30 p.m. I got from the counter and wandered back into the living room to turn off the TV. I decided to take the rest of the juice upstairs. I went back into the kitchen, opened the French fridge door, and stopped. Turning my head to focus outside, I could see someone was standing in the garden. I shut the fridge door and turned off the light so they couldn't see me so easily. I moved slowly to lean on the kitchen counter to get a better look. All the doors were locked and all the neighbors were home. I took a moment to remind myself this. Still, my heart quickened a bit as I stood there straining to see his or her shape in the darkness at the end of the garden. I had to keep glancing away to keep their fuzzy outline clear in my vision. They were standing very still and were a little thin. But that's all I could see. I couldn't tell anything else. Oh, I said aloud. It was the garden umbrella leaning up against the back fence. I forgot that we used it for barbecues. I smiled at myself, pleased that I didn't go to get too worked up, and went upstairs to my bedroom. I laid on my pillow and propped my head, my head up on the pillow. Opened my laptop on my stomach to see if anybody was online. Apparently someone else was bored and saw my name pop up. Chris, hey. Hey, you okay? Yeah, bored. Are your parents still away? For a couple more weeks. Why don't I come around? I don't want to be rude, but I kind of can't be bothered to hang out tonight, lol. Thanks, though. I know what you mean. It's cool. What about tomorrow? Yeah, that sounds better. Cool, I'll be, I'll be around about one. I got some family stuff to do in the morning. Okay. Do you still have a tent, by the way? We can camp in the garden or something. Ah, stunner party. I love you too, bro. Whatever, lol. You got ten, right? Yeah, somewhere, somewhere. Let me check. BRB. I got up from my bed and headed to check the cupboard under the stairs. I didn't know where the tent was, but it seemed a good place to start. I opened the cupboard door and started shifting coats aside. Some cardboard boxes were stacked up at the back and might be hiding it. So I started unstacking them. I took out a couple of the easy to reach ones and had a stroke of good luck. As a tent bag came into view, I leaned over the other boxes and picked up the bag. I took the big garden umbrella that sat beside it too. Just in case it rained tomorrow, I paused. I put the tent down. 
It took me a couple of seconds to get back to the kitchen window and focus on the darkness outside. My eyes weren't yet adjusted to the dark, so I couldn't see all the way to the back fence. Turning off the kitchen light, I leaned on the counter and continued staring at the same point. The other Gurner features began to fade into view one by one. Fading my previous mental image, I wasn't sure what I wanted to see. The darkness gave way to the familiar forms I knew, but after a while, I was certain there st still stood a figure against the back garden fence. It hadn't moved. It stood there for 15 minutes looking at it. I couldn't tell the shape properly, but it did look like someone standing there. I decided it wasn't a threat. I thought if I was in any real danger, I would have been a lot more worried by now. That thought kept me calm, but I also wanted to find out what it was. I couldn't stand there forever. I jogged upstairs, picked up my laptop, and brought it down with two with me to the counter. Uh, could you come around now? Oh? Yeah, I think I see something in my garden. What is it? An animal? No, it's tall. Thought it was an umbrella. And now you're sure it isn't? I don't know. I thought it was someone. But now I'm sure it's not a person. It just looks weird, and I don't think it was there before. Before when? I don't know. Earlier today, maybe? I can't remember. Are you scared? I'd feel better if someone else was, was here. Well, I did offer to come around, and I am bored. So yeah. Yeah, I'll come soon. Cool, thanks. Use the front gate. I sat there watching the black shape lean against the fence for another ten minutes. Eventually the doorbell rang. I opened it, and Chris ran in and bear hugged me. It's been too long, Chris Mock cried. Yeah, it must have been a whole day, I retorted smiling. The torment, he smiled, pretending to ignore me. Look, come over here, I said, pushing him off the washing kitchen. I switched off the light and pointed to the figure direc figure's direction. Look, look, give me a sex said Chris. I can't see it properly. A minute later, he noticed. That black thing? Yeah. Um, I was still there looking at it for a while. I've expected it to be gone when he looked. He leaned off the counter. It's just a big plant or a plank of wood or something. Let's go watch TV. Will you check with me to make sure I ask? Do you have a torch? He returned. No, I admitted. But well, we could check if we keep the kitchen light on. And open a back door a little, he offered. I thought for a second and agreed. He said, but said we should stay right by the house. We slipped on our trainers and opened the back door. Stepping onto the patio, I felt the air was heavy and warm that night. Chris walked behind me. We stood very close to the door. Peering at the back fence. Should we? I just started to speak when he quickly stepped into the house again, still looking at the fence. What? I asked, following him in. I turned and realized the figure was gone. It was obvious from the light coming from the back door that the fence and the rest of the garden was just as it always was. Where is it? Chris said. If it was leaning against the fence, it probably fell over into the bush or something. I tried to convince us both. We stared out for a few seconds longer, decided that we were too nervous to go and check. I don't usually go give in to my night terrors, but now they were just beginning to click into my head. Can you stay over for the night? I asked Chris. Um, yeah, sure. It didn't sound like he really wanted to. He kept his eyes on the fence. We both went inside and locked the door before going up to my room. I got out a sleeping bag for Chris. And he drew in the curtains without looking outside into the garden again. We talked about stupid stuff for a couple hours to take our minds off the garden and fell asleep. In the morning, I found Chris's sleeping bag empty. I called out to Chris and he said he was downstairs. So I threw on a t-shirt and went down. Sleep well? I asked. Yeah, pretty well, but I kept thinking about the garden and stuff. Hey, did you find that tent? He returned. Er, yeah. I answered, remembering that shape, which I had forgotten about until now. Well, I was thinking about camp the camping thing and thought maybe we could bring the tent to my house. 
it would just make a, a change, you know? I didn't have to ask him why. I wasn't too keen on staying in my garden after last night. Wait, last night, come to think of it. If someone was out and wanted to check the garden while I was while it was in pitch black. I asked Chris and he hesitantly agreed. We put on our trainers and stepped in, out into the garden. We didn't know what what we were so worried about. It was bright and colorful. The plants and bushes and bushes are around the edges of the garden smelled good, and there was a bird in one of the small trees, singing out for its mate somewhere. We walked to the back fence to find nothing out of place, and looked over the bushes in front of the paneling to check if anything lay behind them. We found nothing. I walked around the edge of the whole garden once more, while Chris tried whistling to the bird. He cocked his head from side to side, trying to figure him out. It was a warm day, perfect for camping that evening. I decided. We talked as we filled a couple of rucksacks with sleeping bags and some food from the kitchen. We didn't want to set up a fire, so we packed some tinned hot dogs, bread, a packet of hot, a uh, packet of tomatoes, and chocolate, as well as some bottles of water. There's a forest just next to my house, which is actually pretty good, Chris explained. Our garden backs onto the edge of it. I stayed in a tent there once with my dad. It was for my first little camping trip when I was like seven. I remember it was so exciting at the time. I thought we were really roughing it like some hardcore mountaineers. Chris laughed at himself. If we get too cold or need more food, we can just go to my house. My parents are out so we have free run of the place. Yours are away too? I questioned. It's their anniversary, so they're out for the night. He explained. They're staying in a hotel for the next town over. They'll be back in the morning. Apparently, leaving your kids behind was was in fashion this summer. At about noon, we left my house with a two rucksacks, a sleeping bag for each of us, and a tent, and made our way to Chris's house. It was fairly close by and a part of the same pleasant neighborhood. We talked and joked a lot, walking side by side, nodding and greeting a couple of familiar neighbors as we went. It was a crazy nice day. The sun was almost too much. It was hot on our necks, and the trees by the sidewalk seemed to glow green from underneath as the sunlight passed through the leaves. A sprinkler offered us some water as we walked by one house, and it felt good on my hot arms. I was already sweating by the time we got to Chris's place. We had been walking for more than 20 minutes. We didn't go inside his house immediately because it was so hot. We went straight to his garden and dumped our bags in the shade. He wasn't joking. The gate of his garden backed straight onto an impressive forest. Very tall, thin trees stood high above the house. And continued as far as I could see. Some bush bushes and shrubs littered the forest floor, but most of it was either grass or fairly smooth sections of dirt. I didn't see how this forest was classified as small. Looking good, right? He boasted. It's awesome. I admitted, opening the gate and surveying the area. I walked out in between the trees and found a flat spot for the tent. I turned around to ask Chris's opinion and paused a little disappointed. It didn't look like real, real camping when his house was so obviously in our faces. Let's go a little further in it, in so it at least feels legit, I said and walked back to pick up my bags. Chris objected to carrying his heavy shit any further. We walked in a straight line from Chris's house. He kept, kept checking behind us until the house was just about obscured by trees in front of each other. We had only gone a short way, but in the forest was already thicker and greener. There was even a long rope swing hanging from one of the trees, but it was too old to hold our weight. So we decided to keep our spines unbroken and give it a miss. I unpacked the tent and set it up with Chris's help. 
and we threw our sleeping bags inside. I laid down inside to, to test it out. It was so warm and humid. I had to, to adjust my breathing for a second. I stepped out again and asked Chris if he had to a torch for the evening. I can do better than that, was his response, and he took off towards the house. It was too hot to run after him, so I opened my rucksack and cracked open a bottle of water, downing half of it and putting the rest back in the pack. I lay down on a patch of grass and looked up at the canopy. The leaves were shifting gently in the breeze I could feel from down there here. I watched them sway and mesh together until I heard Chris return. Did you get a torch? I asked, closing my eyes. The sun shone through my eyelids and colored my vision red. I listened to the soft sound of his footsteps in the grass and walked past me towards the rope swing. That's not going to hold you, I warned as I heard him tug the branch with a small creak. He tugged it and, cr and it creaked in response. I listened. He tucked it once more, and again, there was a moment of silence. I guess he was still waiting, weighing it up. And then another tug. He continued to tug a few more times, and a creaking followed each one. I was sure I wouldn't hold his weight, and I smiled, predicting one big creak and a snap of the rope. Rope or branch broke. I waited for some final tugs were made. Creak, creak. I waited still. Creak, creak, creak. Yo! I heard Chris's voice coming from his garden. I sat bolt upright, almost spraining my neck as I snapped my head sideways to face his house. He was jogging through the trees, holding an electric lantern. I switched my gaze in the other direction towards the first swing. It was hanging still, nothing nearby. I stood up and turned full circle, nothing in any other direction. What? I mouthed myself. Walking towards the rope, I tugged it gently. It didn't creak. I pulled it harder. It didn't creak. My mouth went dry. I jumped up and grabbed hold and yanked it down. The branch bent a little as my feet touched the floor. It still didn't make a sound. I kept hold of it as, it, as I stared up towards the branches. But eventually the rope gave way under my weight somewhere in the middle. A soft thud fell on my ears as a thick rope fell in front of me. Chris was rattling the lantern as he came by. I never used this before. I got it for Christmas for my cousin. She buys some weird presents. Ah, I see the, the swing is dead. Let's have a proper burial in the memory of all the joy it gave us. I didn't respond. I continued looking up at the branch with, with half a rope swing tied to it. Hey, are you good? Chris followed my gaze. I thought you already come back. I said immediately. I wasn't the type to let things slide within. Oh, it's nothing. What? He replied. Someone walked by me and was messing around with the rope swing. Who was it? I don't know. Are they still still around? I don't know. My eyes closed and I'm... I don't know. I, I had my eyes closed and was laying just there. I pointed, but then I heard you shout, so I looked around. There was nothing here. I heard them walk by, by my head. I felt a bit sick. Look, calm down for a second. Chris began. It's middle of the day. We're 30 feet from my house. And even if it was a person, so what? It's just some public woods anyone can come through here. It made some sense. He was right about it being public. But then where were they? They glanced around one more time. However, the trees quickly... Layered up, and I couldn't see far at all. I guess it was possible for me to lose track of someone here in a short dis distance. Okay, I said. Man, I can stay alone in a house for weeks on end, but I can't handle a short walk through the woods on a summer's day. That's why you fought some muscle. The car Chris wheeling and laying above his head, and I laughed. We spent the day walking around the forest and returned to the tent to get some water. When we were too hot, we talked about school and what other plans were for the future. We talked about dreams we had and ghosts and creatures that lurked in the dark. Neither of us were too scared of things like that. But they made for good camping stories. 
Chris told a particularly good one of a woman who lived in the woods. She had the head of a cat. If you heard a rasping meow, that meant she was trying to find you. If she stopped meowing, it signified you were found, and she was quickly making her way towards you. It made my skin crawl a little, and we stopped telling so stories soon after that. The light of day eventually faded, and it was getting hard to see, so we headed back to the tent for the night. The impressive heat during the day had killed our appetites, so we left the food for now and decided we'd eat it in the night. If we got hungry, Chris hung an electric lantern at the front of the tent, flicking it on as he did so. It was surprisingly bright and spilled a yellow light onto the ground and onto the trees that faced us. The warm glow looked dramatic, but whatever was beyond the light was hidden in blackness. Our immediate air area was clear, but after a few paces, the light seemed to stop dead. It looked weird. Chris ducked, ducked under the tent opening, and I followed him. The sleeping bags looked inviting as the heat from earlier had gone, and it was too cold for the shirt, shirts and shorts. We got inside and took the lantern with us. Can you hear the meowing? I said, my head tilted as I strained to hear. Yeah, yeah, I can hear some bullshit too. Chris smiled and zipped up his sleeping bag. Damn, I thought I had him. Oh well. I zipped up my own bag and we lay there, talking for a little while. And then the exhaustion of such a hot summer hit us, and we fell asleep. I had a dream that we were walking to Chris's house again, but there were more trees than before, and it was getting dark very quickly. I blinked and suddenly it was night. With the force sprawling in every direction, the rope sling hung in front of me. I turned around and Chris was gone. I heard a creak behind me. A feeling came over me like I had missed a step on the stairs. For some reason, I couldn't turn around. I started walking straight ahead and the rope swing soon came into my view again. I was aware I was in a nightmare. The rope swing slowly lifted itself up into the trees. I watched it disappear. I walked over and stood beneath it where it had been, and there was a rustle above me. I left my eyes to the canopy. A black figure with its head of a cat came hurriedly toward hurling downwards with its mouth open perfectly wide. One of its teeth touched my left eye. I tore myself away gasping as I sat up in my in a tent. My back was damp with sweat, and Chris was asleep next to me. The lantern was still on, and I could see her backpacks at the end of the tent. I took a moment to breathe, and then let myself lay back down, my head thumping on the floor a little too hard. I once then reached for the bottom water to my side, downing a few mouthfuls. I couldn't fall asleep with the glow of the lantern on my eyelids, so I sat up, searched the tent for it, and quickly realized the light was coming from outside. Chris, I said, still confused from my from sleep. He went with something to reply. Chris, where's the lantern? Uh, somewhere. I said, slowly and sleepily before turning over. Looking around again, the light was obviously coming from outside. I weighed up the options. Either some murderer had snuck into our tent and done nothing but take the lantern outside. Or we didn't actually bring it into the tent, and I had to remember wrongly. That sounded more convincing. So I knelt by the tent door and unzipped it. From the opening, I looked around. It was immediately obvious where a glow was coming from. Why couldn't I see it? I looked up. The lantern was resting 20 feet in the air, hanging in the dark. Goosebumps swept across my skin, and I zipped up the door before shaking Chris. Chris, please wake up. We heard the urgency in my voice and sat up. What? What's wrong? Chris said, rubbing his eyes. The lantern is hanging outside. But I brought it in, he assured me. I felt sick as my reasoning broke. We both looked at the front of the tent. We should go back to the house, I said. My resolve buckling. 
I was just a kid in a forest whose parents were away. Were away. I'm not walking through the dark, he replied. Chris was now looking worried. We've got a lantern. I stopped myself. We looked at the front of the tent again. We couldn't sit there forever. We were getting scared as we sat there doing nothing. So this was the plan. We weren't going back to sleep. We would get the lantern back somehow. Leave everything here and spend the night in Chris's house. I hated being the one to go first. I wanted to turn back. Even just crouching by the tent entrance. Unzipping the fabric door. I looked around. Nothing. I peered over the tent behind us. Nothing in sight. Literally nothing. Everything was... Everything was black outside of the of the light. I took a step out and it was cold. Chris said the same thing. I said the same. As he stood right by my side looking over his shoulder. He turned back and saw the lantern in the air. Oh my god. We stood there looking at it for a few seconds that seemed to be crawled by. Eventually I worked out which tree it was hanging from. The broken rope swing at my feet confirmed it. Way up, way up out of reach, the lantern hung above our heads, tied to the other end of the rope. It still dangled from the darkness. I couldn't work it out. It was high up. Too high up for even a ladder. The trees were thin, and the bear, besides the leaves made up the canopy, there was nowhere to climb. Picking up the length of the rope that had snapped off earlier, I bundled it up and tied a knot and aimed it at the lantern. I took a step back and jumped, tossing it into the air. It caught the lantern on its side and sent it swinging. It, th it threw shadows rocking around us. Suddenly, I suddenly wish it I hadn't hit it. The light made the shadows lean from side to side with the lantern. The horrible, unnatural swaying made me panic and my eyes became wet as fear took solid hold of me. I picked up the rope again and lobbed it desperately at the lantern. I missed and the bundle of ropes sailed off into the darkness. Helplessly, I turned to Chris, who had already grabbed his backpack. He spanned around and threw it with a yelp, and it hit the lantern dead on, and it, f it fell and thudded to the floor with a crack. But the light was still on. I ran to pick it up. I turned to Chris and almost cried with relief. Okay, go, 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 let's go. I heard Jenny start jogging quickly towards the house, his house, as I followed. We half ran, half stumbled off into the dark, checking over our shoulders and working ourselves up as our thoughts were consumed by everything that may be waiting in the trees for us. I don't know how long we were moving, but it soon became apparent that Chris's house wasn't in this direction. For God's sake, where is it? Chris said, tension taking hold of his voice. We have to find a tent and try it again. A couple of te tears were forming at the corner of, uh, of his eyes. They were probably on mine too. But my heart was thumping so hard it didn't, I didn't notice. Okay. I took a breath and we turned around heading in a straight line directly behind us. What if we didn't find a tent? I couldn't stop myself. Thinking that over and over as we retraced our steps. We walked for what seemed like twice as long before the light finally fell on the side of the tent. We ran up and stood close to its side, looking around trying to figure out which direction we should go. Silence was like build up of a nightmare. Right before some horrible thing lurches out at you, screaming. The comparison, comparison made me gag and I scrunched my eyes shut. The hair on my skin lifting. My temples were so hot it felt like my brain was studying against the inside of my skull. I be couldn't begin to guess where the house was. We couldn't see about 10 feet from the lantern. And then, pitch black, there was no clues. Every direction looked wrong. Chris took the lantern from me and walked in a small circle, straining his eyes to try to see. I say put. Chris, turn it off. I whispered to him hurriedly. What? He asked. I stepped quickly and quietly towards him, bringing my face to him. There's something in the tent. His gaze shifted past towards me. He stood there staring. We were standing on the left-hand side of the tent. 
from this angle, I could just about see, see the unzip door hanging open. But I remember leaving it that way. So that wasn't what was making me clench my teeth together. A few feet away, my rucksack sat outside on the dry earth, with food I had packed now neatly arranged, trailing from it. Our sleeping bags were also nicely laid out end to end, making the line of belongings laid straight into the mouth of the tent. I took a, a careful step toward forward so the light could pass more easily through the fabric. It could have couldn't have been a trick of the light. Something big and dark obviously crouched it crouched with what I guessed was in its front facing the open door. I hated myself for not seeing it sooner. It didn't move at all or seem to breathe. It just sat, waiting for us to investigate the display it had made. Turn it off, I whispered again. Chris continued staring deaf to me. Chris! I pleaded in a whisper. This voice from a voice from nearby joined in. Chris! We both heard it, and, our, and the blood fell in our veins. It came from the tent, a slow, strained rasp of a voice. It sounded like a parrot copying in a new word. It, uh, the sound clicked across my skin and crept into my ears. The light flicked off with a click that was too loud. Chris grabbed my shoulder and I clenched my fists closed. Painfully tight, we stood there in bleak darkness. I didn't want to move. And I didn't want to stay. My brain fought for control as my legs waited for a decision. Rooted in place, we grew shadow, quiet breaths. Blackness press pressing on our eyes like water. Sweat ran down my neck. I couldn't see the tent. Chris. Something said, turn it off. My stomach flipped inside out as the thing in the tent played with my words. I quickly grabbed the Chris's hand, yanking him in the opposite direction. I ran like I never had before, Chris's legs thudding alternately with mine. The sprint continued for about a minute. We lost ourselves as we ran through the absolute darkness. I forgot we were where we were, and I couldn't see what was in front of my face. I ran ahead and on into a tree, my forehead struck its side with a sickening hollow knock. Sparks slid up inside my eyes as I choked back the pain. It hurt so much I couldn't breathe. Chris tried to pull me on, but I buckled on to the floor on my knees and threw up. As I clasped onto my back, my head went numb. Chris lifted me up. Please don't stop, please, please, he begged. I couldn't reply. Please, please keep going. I forced my legs to take my weight and locked my knees upright. Leaning on Chris, my body felt empty. And a little blood rolled down my forehead and into my brow. I wiped it away as I tried to grasp the situation again. But the pain was too much. Wait, I can't. I begged. Just wait, just wait. We stood together in inky woods, but we could have been anywhere. I couldn't see Chris as he huddled next to me. It didn't feel like darkness. It felt like someone had wrapped my head in a blanket. Neither of us said a word as we waited, but our breathing was loud, and I wondered for what distance it could be heard. Reality began to return to me, and the pain was now just just about bearable. I straightened up, grasping at what was happening. The pins of fear sank into me a second time. I started counting my head. One minute passed without any sound in the world. The wind was dead. And the birds might be too. Another minute went by. I continued counting. In three minutes, we were still alone. Was it even looking for us? I reached for Chris's arm in the dark. He jumped and I touched when I touched it. But I steadied him with the other. And he was still holding the lantern. Good. We had light on our side. Now if only we could use it. I went over the, over the events hurriedly in my mind. The lantern was hanging from a tree. We got out of the tent. Then couldn't find our way home. By the time we returned to the tent, something was in it. But then why did it take the lantern to do nothing while we slept? If it was sheer luck that we were alone when we were trying to get the lantern, I wonder what how small the possibility was us was of us getting a second chance. I stayed silent for a moment and then whispered as best as I could. 
Chris, we need to turn on the lantern. We need to get the f we need to fucking get away from here. We can make a run for your house, but we need to see. Now, please, you have to stay here. Chris tried to whisper too. We can't we can wait for morning if we have to. We can't turn it on. I could hear in his voice that his eye was breaking through. Just just keep quiet. You fucking have to, please. I parted my lips to try again, but as I did, I heard something. A very faint clicking sound from somewhere in the dark. It was almost inaudible, but it was there. An irregularly stuttering, stuttering, clicking sound. I sat, I sat fingernails on a wooden table, and it was moving. It came from in front of us. I was sure of it. A steady click, clack, click. Only my ears so he, so he tried to gauge the distance. I was drawing closer. Click, 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 clack. It stopped. I was glad for the first time in my life that I couldn't see what was waiting in the dark. Perhaps that meant we were also hidden, as my thoughts fired off in every direction. I gave the thing in the darkness an image of a cat headed woman, and it terrified me. I was waiting for to hear that meow. But my ears were met with something else. Chris! I twisted my throat and tried not to cry. Chris! I said his name twice. I cupped my head and over my mouth. The horrible scraping dialogue sounded a few steps away. The words were, s were said oddly, with no meaning behind them. They were just sounds that this thing had picked up. And was now using them to catch us out in the dark. Chris let go of my hand, and I heard his foot plant softly on the grass behind him as he prepared to run. Don't you dare! I said it to project into his mind. Don't you, don't you make a sound! Chris, please! Sam is so wrong. Drawn out like a door slowly opening, Chris let out a whisk limper as it called him. I froze and waited for something, anything to happen. There was a long silence, and I held my breath for as long as I could. I couldn't wait anymore. Very slowly, I reached out to Chris and put my hand on his shoulder. And very carefully, we both lifted our feet and managed to step without making a sound. We backstepped away from the voice, and it didn't stop moving. But ever so carefully, so, so slowly, I didn't care how long it would take us to get somewhere. If it took us an hour, every step, we were going to get out. Chris backed into a tree and gasped audibly. The clicking start started up immediately. Click, click, clack, click. It rolled on consistently, moving towards us. I didn't know what to do. All I could think of was to screw my eyes shut and try not to scream. As we stood there, the clicking came to a stop, an arm's length away from where we stood. Silence. Chris, turn it on. Please. Fear took over. Chris searched, switched on the light, and it tore off in the other direction without looking behind him. I wheeled in place and held that lantern in my sight like nothing else existed. It did, we didn't dare look at the thing. We could hear it. Our footsteps butted at the grass, and the thing pursued us with a tap, 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 tap. Now, like scurrying little claws on hard earth. As I ran desperately, pitch up to the light, the sound suddenly rose up behind me. Over our heads, in between the trees, this wasn't happening. It was going to drop down on us. Turn! I screamed. I didn't care anymore. If we were going to get out with our lives, we were going to have to run for them. We suddenly changed course. The tapping s stopped for a moment, long enough for us to gain a few feet before it came in our direction again. My legs were cramped horribly, and Chris was gasping hard. We couldn't keep this up. Where were we? I saw the light from the lantern come to an abrupt halt up ahead. I didn't have time to stop and brace myself to a to thump into Chris, but the light passed ben beneath my feet. He had dropped the lantern. I turned my head and watched it recede into the darkness. It was immediately too far for me to go back. The thing would be on me in a second. 
Chris. I was I was crying and swiping from tears from my cheeks as I ran, preparing for my face to connect with a tree at any moment. Keep going, I heard Chris from up ahead. There's a light. My vision was blurry from, e from tears, but could see it, an orange glow hanging in the air in the distance. Another one? What was happening? I wanted to scream to at him to avoid it, but I realized it was a street light. My legs felt like I was running through water, but I pushed them harder with the goal in sight. Gradually and painfully, the light drew closer, as did the clicking. The thing could move like nothing I knew. I saw Chris's figure pass underneath the street light, and then he was gone again. Don't stop! I yelled as I pressed, approached the edge of the forest, and my legs adjusted as the forest floor gave way to a solid footing. I could see a row of more street lights heading off, off to the right, and Chris's figure was passing regularly underneath each. When I was sure I was completely out of the trees, I didn't stop. I ran under several more streetlights, putting as much distance as I could manage between us. On the edge of the woods, I realized after a while that the clicking had stopped. I needed to see if we were okay. I turned my head and looked back and the row of lights, keeping my gaze on the first light. My pace slowed as the pain in my head and legs came back. There was silence once more, and the lights revealed an empty pathway. I jogged on and kept my eyes on the glow, expecting to see something at any minute, but it but it lit up nothing but concrete in the edge of the road. Is it there? The question pulsed in my mind over and over. As I turned ahead and continued catching up to Chris, I caught sight of something pass under the first street light. An almighty shock went through me as fears were confirmed. I let out a cry and picked up the pace once more, sprinting between the lights. The image was burned into my mind. I hardly caught the glimpse of the thing, but it was white and massive. And almost brushed the street light as it went under it. It had a long, upright body full of kinks, like it had unfolded itself. That's all I was able to tell. It must have had a face and limbs, but I didn't have time to see. I didn't look again. The path gave way to more lights, and soon I could see the glow of windows and some houses either side of the road. I recognized where we were, close to my house by some miracle, a little further and we would be there. My house, I yelled, and Chris listened, turning left on a side street side street and dashing down with a panic on my side. I reached the turning and looked down the road and see Chris jumping the fence into my garden. Hurry up! I heard him scream. Reaching the fence, I planted my hands on top, hoisting myself over and shredding my elbows in the process. My ankles stung as I thudded into the garden and sprinted towards the kitchen door. Chris stepped inside, gasping for air as I fumbled a key into the lock I rushed it sideways. We both flew into the kitchen and slammed the door behind us. I locked it from the inside, and we both sprinted upstairs into the bathroom, locking it behind us. What was that? I managed to say in a panic whisper, wondering if it would get in. Did you see it? No. Chris crouched under the window, letting tears roll. Shit, it was so tall. It, it, it was, I couldn't. Don't tell me. Chris cut me off. I molded over again and again as we sat there. Minutes slowly ticked into hour by to hours. My head was fizzing all the while. And I could still hear its voice, that disgusting voice. My elbows and forearms were st sticky with blood, and we both looked at the floor. The occasional sob coming from the two of us. Our hearts banged in our chest, and we spent the night that way. Light streamed in from the window, but we didn't unlock the bathroom door until noon. We crept downstairs, the kitchen door was still locked, and nothing was in the house. I looked out the living room window, another perfect day. No people walked by, but the sprinklers were on, and I could hear the birds again. It helped, cal helped to calm our nerves. That tank can stay there. I said at last. Yeah, Chris agreed. We stayed off in the living room, with the TV off that all day. We didn't know what to do. 
we talked about if we should call the police or something. The day crawled by as we tried to rake our thoughts together and think about think of what to do next. But all that went through our my mind was what had just happened. Not what we should be doing. By the time it was dark at about 9 p.m., the phone rang. It was Chris's parents asking if I'd, I'd seen him as they were getting worried. They had just got back from out of town. I let them know he, he was okay and asked if he if they could come pick us both up from my house because something had happened. They wanted to know what, but I said we wanted to tell them when they get here. They said they'll be here soon. Relief washed over us as adults were on their way to make sh it, way to make everything was all right. They would believe us. They didn't lie about, about these things, even if they were skept skeptical. They would at least believe that some dangerous animal was in the forest, and that was good enough for us. I went to the kitchen for some juice from the fridge and realized I hadn't had a drink all day. I could hear water dripping in the sink, so I turned the faucet tighter and plugged some juice. As I headed towards the living room, the water started started to tap again. With the light on, I realized it wasn't coming from the sink, or anywhere in the room for that matter. It sounded like it was coming from further away. I looked out in the garden, and I could see a fuzzy, tall silhouette leaning up against the back fence in the dark. Actually, the tapping sounded more like clicking. The figure slowly moving away from the fence and clicked across the grass towards the house. Please. And that's the end of the story. That's it. Yeah, that was a really creepy end. Those kids are probably dead. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why, but I gotta pee again, so I'll be right back. Um, book room entertain stream. <laughs>
I'm back. I am back. Well, hello there. Alright, I'm gonna stop staring at them. <laughs> Buckhorn, there's one thing I'm glad that I know you wouldn't do, which would be to add the certain three clips that are cancelable. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't add that to, to sound alerts. <laughs> but I know you wouldn't. <laughs> Anyways, you ready to hear the next story? Just a weird coincidence of me not paying attention to the surroundings. Honestly, it's a good thing it happened in GTA and not any other game. Because <laughs> GTA, at least, it's not as bad. If I were to do something like Minecraft, oh boy, that would be so bad. <laughs> Yeah, anyways, so let's get ready for the next story. The next story is the... Fuck, how do I say this? The Dionia House. I'm hoping I didn't say it wrong. It would be hard to be racist in Minecraft, I would think. Then you're a lot of racist in Minecraft. Actually, I think they're... I think they were confirmed to be a different race of human. So, they're not fully human, but they're a different race. <laughs> or species. Why did I say race instead of species? Am I gonna get cancelled again? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, this is the, the word I, 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 I couldn't, I wasn't sure if I said it correctly. I said, I don't know how the word is spelled. So it sounds correct to me. Oh, I, well, I just sent it. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Yeah. I'm just gonna go with uh, the DNA house. Anyways, the DNA house. October 7th, 2004. Jennifer, friends, and family of Mark. As promised, here are copies of the correspondence I received from Mark over the course of the last month. For the most part, I have merely copied and pasted them for my email application. As you read, he requested this in hopes that you'll better understand why he did what he did. I made this site because it's the most efficient way to share Mark's emails with all of you, but I'm not advertising this to anyone. But I do think it would be wise. Wait, 
I do think it would be wise to pass this URL along to anyone who may help with the investigation. As I collect more information from various sources, I'll update this site to keep it an accurate record. I'll have that link at the end of the series as well. If you need to speak with me, Jin has my number. Thank you for your patience, and again, I am profoundly sorry. Eric. Come on. Oh my gosh, there's an actual website. Oh wait, no there isn't. It got deleted. <laughs> sorry. Wait, does it really? So you can't see it? It's not even a cuss word or, or a slur or anything. What the fuck? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, that's weird, Bookworm. But, yeah. I don't know why. Hold on. I can just send it to you in DMs if you can't see it. Oh, what the fuck? Why am I in the red? Why am I in the red? What the fuck? What's going on? Did my computer switch internet for some reason? God damn it! It did! I'm going to murder my computer! Alright, I'll be right. I may stream may drop for a second, but I need to connect it to the correct Wi Fi. Give me a moment. All right, I'm back. Apparently, OPS, even though I was connected to the internet, wouldn't fucking connect to anything. I literally had to hit stop streaming and stream again. Fuck you, OPS. That needs to be a kink that needs to work out. Anyways, do you do you need me to read the whole, uh read the excerpt again? Like, I barely got into the story, so it's fine if I need to read the, the one paragraph. Hopefully, I- hopefully you guys are still here, too. <laughs> I don't know why I did that. Why my computer keeps connecting to the goddamn wrong Wi-Fi? Pizza crap? Um... Is anybody still here? It says I have four viewers, but I don't know. Oh, now it says two. <laughs> okay, you're still here. Okay, yeah, Bookworm, I sent you the um the the name of, of the house. <laughs> in DMs, because apparently he says, like, Twitch blacked out or something. Anyways, whatever. <laughs> Hopefully, we won't have another issue. I reread everything. Just in case. Alright. 
Athena House. October 7th, 2004. Jennifer, friends, and families of Mark. As promised, here are the copies of the correspondence I received from Mark over the course of the last month. For the most part, I have merely copied and po pasted them from my email application. As you read, he requested this, in hopes that you better understand why he did what he did. I made this site because it's the most efficient way to share Mark's emails with all of you. I'm not advertising this to anyone, but I do not think it will help. It would be wise to pass this URL along to anyone who may help with the investigation. As I collect more information from various sources, I'll update this site to keep it an accurate record. I'll have that link at the end of the series as well. If you need to speak with me, Jen has my number. Thank you for your patience, and again, I am profoundly sorry. Eric. September 6, 2004. From Conjury Mark. Date. Monday, September 6, 2004. 8.17 a.m. Subject, an old friend. Eric. Hey, man. It's Mark from Houston. This is the Saturday Night Gang. Feels like it's a long time, long time ago, doesn't it? I found your email from your site. Looks like you're out in LA now. Cool. I remember telling you you should be out there, doing the California thing. You still with Connie? I'm in Dallas now. I met someone who works in my building. We've been seeing each other for two years now. Listen, the reason I'm writing to you out of the blue is because I got a newspaper article in the mail. Maybe you got one, too. It's about Andrew. You remember Drew? Travis would pick him up most of the time. Messy hair, sort of the fanboy type. I didn't remember his last name until I got this thing. And now it's really disturbing me. Did you know what happened? Did you hear about it already? Let me know if you have some time to talk. I can call you or you can call me if that works better. I'm going to, s going to see if I can track down Travis or and Dave. A quick search didn't seem to turn up any leads. But maybe they, they just don't have any websites. If you still talk to either of them, let me know. Thanks, Mark. September 8th, 2004. From Conjury, Mark. Date, Wednesday, September 8th. 2004, 744 AM. Subject, free and old friend. Eric, thanks for, for a quick reply. I didn't mean to sound cryptic in my first email. I'm just reluctant to guess, I guess. I hadn't really seen or thought about Andrew since he stopped showing up for the game night. And that was five years ago. That was about the time we all went on our, our own ways. Back in 1999, you moved out west, I moved up to Dallas, etc. So when I got this article in my mailbox, it caught me by surprise. And yeah, I'll transcribe the thing for you. I, I wasn't sure if maybe you were the one who sent it to me. I'll put it, it into this email at the bottom. I remember him. He was never the kid with the idea he was. The kid who agreed with yours. So as to get the joke, usually. Laughed the longest. That's Andrew in a nutshell. Yeah. At least that's how I remember him. He got on my nerves sometimes, but damn. If he didn't love being part of the gang, he'd ask me for some poker chips on card night or borrow dice for my bag, that sort of thing. Whenever we play Tecmo Bowl... On your Nintendo, he always loved to be on my team, which would have been fine if it was any good. I haven't heard from Travis or Dave in years. They fell off. The radar, about the same time you did, none of us made. Much attempt to stay in touch, it was just one of those things. That's okay. I wasn't trying to point fingers. It happens. 
but I was hoping you had already heard about Andrew. If you'd gotten a copy of the article, I still haven't been able to get a number or email for Travis or Dave. Maybe they know more about this than we do. Andrew usually hitched a ride with Travis most of the time. It was on the way home for Travis. Didn't Andrew le live with his mom? Like, in an apartment? And his stepdad was a real, real estate broker? Had that one house way out past Highway 6? You remember that? Andrew was scared to death of that house. Here's the article. There's a photo of Andrew with it. Looks maybe like his driver's license photo still had messy hair. Gunman shoots two. Kill self and boozy restaurant diners. At the roadside breakfast cafe on Interstate 84, led fled to the parking lot in the park back picnic panic yesterday afternoon when a man entered and began shooting patrons inside cutting two. The couple, John, Lucy, and Madison, were having lunch when 26-year-old Andrew Hughes entered wielding a Smith & Weston 59 pistol, according to police. When his claimed perpetrator was muttering to himself as he approached the smoking section and opened fire into the first occupied booth, fatally wounding the Mad Madsons. Soon after, he turned the wagon white weapon on himself. All three were taken to paramedics, so to St. Alphonsus Regional Medical Center, where John Madsen and Shooter were pronounced dead. Lucy Madsen, 37, remained in critical condition for several hours but did not survive the night. Police were investigating Hughes' work and personal background, but as of this morning, a motive for the attack is unknown. If there's more to the article, I didn't get it. That's where. It was torn off. The other side is part of Diller's ad. It's really bothering me, Eric. What the hell is Drew doing in Boozy with a fucking gun? He hung out with us for almost two years. I just don't get it. Something else is eating at me. I can't figure it out yet. Mark. September 9th, 2004. Concondry Mark. Date Thursday, September. September 9th, 2004, 2 o'clock p.m. Subject, Andrew. Hey, I know how you feel. It's hard not to think of the times he sat next to us at the table, smiling like a fool, rolling the dice, and moving his pieces around the board. He loved Monopoly Night, always wagged his tongue when he counted money. I don't think he realized he did that. It's impossible to think of him shooting up a diner. Is there a return address on the envelope? No, but the postmark is Idaho, not California or Texas. Not sure if you already consider this, but it's possible. The whole thing is fake. Some sick practical, practical joke made to mess with your head. You can get a newsprint paper for. Yeah, I've considered it. I didn't tell you this earlier, but... But I called St. Alphonsus and asked they had a patient named Andrew Hughes admitted in the last month. They had no record of him. I asked if they, if it would show if he's been pronounced DOA. Then I got transferred to ER where they kept paramedic records and info on all DOAs. They have him listed. He showed up on August 28th, died of a gunshot wound to the head. Pronounced dead by ER resident at 3.14 p.m. I asked for some contact info like a phone or address where he might have been living. I got brushed off, told to call the police for that stuff. The hospital wouldn't give out any personal info, at least not without some signatures. I hadn't called the police yet. That's probably the next step. Glad to hear that you and Connie are going strong. Sorry to sort of dump all of this on you. I just didn't know who else it would care to listen. All right. If anything else comes to this, comes of this, at this point, I'm thinking maybe Drew's mom sent it to me. Maybe Drew kept track of me when I moved to Dallas, and had my address. I'm listed in the book that would explain the logistics part. I'm overthinking things. Take care, Mark. September tenth, two thousand four, 
From Country, Mark. Date, Friday, September 10th, 2004, 3.11 a.m. Subject, Thoughts and Concerns. Hey again, I know it's late or early depending on how you look at it, but this Andrew thing won't go away. I finally realize what's eating at me and I need to spit it out. Do you remember what went on just before Andrew stopped showing up for the game nights at your place? I do. He was gone for two weeks because he had a house sit for his stepfather. Mom and stepdad went on a big vacation every summer, like for, for like 10 days. Andrew was just expected to stay behind. He usually just stayed at his mom's apartment, but that year, he was asked to mine that house his stepdad owned, the one out in the old rich subdivision west of Houston. Maybe the guy had a bunch of houses. He was big on real estate, wasn't he? The guy had inherited his dog from one of his clients, somebody who moved out and didn't want to take the dog with them. I want to say it was an Australian Shepherd. Do you remember any of this? Andrew talked about it the week before. Dog had behavioral problems. Whined, barked, scratched at the door, pissed on the carpet. Didn't want to be inside. Always wanted to be outside. Dad kept it in the kennel instead when it rained. That, except when it rained. Andrew was supposed to take care of the dog. Plus a few other things like mow the lawn and that sort of crap. crap. But Andrew didn't want to go. Dave got into that argument with him about how it was the perfect setup for a younger bachelor. House all to yourself, party time, risky business. Andrew kept saying it was too cold there for a party. Too cold. I distinctly remember that and how he kept asking us to drive out and stay with him while he was house sitting. I didn't think anyone went out there, did they? I never did. We didn't see him for two Saturdays in a row. Then Travis picked him up like usual. Since he was back at his mom's place. That's the one night with Andrew I remember the most. I bet it's the same with you. It was the most bizarre, frustrating night I had with the group. Andrew walked in quoting some commercial verbatim. I want to say that it was a Tide ad. Travis told us he was, he was like that in the car all the way over. Commercial shows, movies, radio songs. First couple of hours gaming was like being in a room with a TV on. Then he started parodying us. He just copied something we said. You remember? Tell me you remember this. I, I can see it in my head so clearly. Oh, and what was his response to anyone's complaints? Okay. Drew, stop quoting Law & Order episodes. Please give the contact commercial a rest, dude. Shut the fuck up and roll your dice. Okay. Then he'd launch into something else a few minutes later. It wasn't just that he would regurgitate that crap. It was that he could take it so far. Whole reams of dialogue and he somehow memorized from one throwaway TV episode. Lyrics to entire songs. It went from odd to funny to disturbing in the first hour. Look, I'll come out and say it. Whatever happened in those ten days, it changed him. It wasn't the same person after that. We all know this. We never talked about it. At least, not with me around. But fuck if we didn't know instantly that the person who came back from the house was not Andrew. I wrote before that I hadn't thought about Andrew since 99. That was a lie. You know your way... Your brain sometimes reminds you of things you hate to dig up. The ones that sour your stomach. I've thought about him a few times. About that night. What was the start of the madness? Or whatever it was that drove him to shoot up a diner? Were we there to see him first lose his grip? Jesus, Eric. Why the hell did we say anything? From Country Mark. Date, Friday, September 10th, 2004. 11.38 a.m. Subject, the door is open. Eric, I woke up to the phone ringing this morning. Turned out to be the reporter from the Idaho, Idaho Statesman. She finally called me back. Did I tell you I called to track down the source of the article? She didn't have any new developments on the story, but will continue to follow up with the police. I asked if she had any other 
other details about the crime stuff that didn't find its way into the article. And we sort of went over her notes. Most of it I already knew. But there's one piece of info that caught my attention. She wrote in an article that Andrew was mumbling or muttering to himself when he entered the restaurant. But she didn't put in what he was saying. According to witnesses, he kept repeating, The door is open. Does that make any sense to you? The door is open? Write me back, Mark. September 12th, 2004. From Conjury Mark. Date, Sunday, September 12th, 2004. 5.10 p.m. Subject, a plan. Eric, I haven't heard from you just... Letting, writing to let you know, I ha I've had a day to put some distance from the whole thing, and I've made a decision. I'm going to drive down to Houston to see if I can find someone in Andrew's family. I once rode, rode with Travis to, to pick, pick Drew up. I think I know where his mom used to live. From there, maybe I can find his, find his stepdad in the house. I tried Boozy lead already. I called the cops, got more questions than answers. And now some Lieutenant Perez plans to call me back in case he needs more testimony from me. Like I know anything. Apparently Andrew was living al alone in a rental up there. Working at a blockbuster video. That's about all I got from the cops in Idaho. So I'm aiming for Houston. Even driving my own car and... And at Cheapo Motel, it's still going to cost me about $200 for the trip. Jenny is worried about me. She'd rather I stay and pretend the police will figure this out on their own. But I have to go down there, Eric. Here's why. I think Eric, uh, I think Andrew was afraid of that house for a reason. Whatever that reason was, during those ten nights, something emptied him. Gutted Andrew like a fish. He yanked out whatever he was inside. Or shocked him into forgetting it all away. He was hollowed out. To fill the void, he absorbed any input he could find. Television, radio, conversation. Soaked it up and pretended it was it as Andrew. He could walk and talk and he wasn't injured. Not physically. But he wasn't the same either. There was a gap I need to fill in my head. Like the time in that house. I have these pieces of Andrew that don't match. I need something to match. Hell, I'll feel better if something will just make sense. I won't ask you to fly down and join me. But I could use your help the same. I have some... All the same. I, I have some questions you might be able to answer. Please call me or send me a note if you know any of these. My phone is redacted. What was his stepfather's name first? What was his stepfather's name first or last? What was his mom's name? Was her last name also Hughes? What was the name of the subdivision where his stepdad's house was? I think Andrew mentioned it. I hope I haven't freaked you out too much with my crazy talk. I know it probably comes off sounding absurd, some of it, or maybe not. You were there for some of this. If you really think I'm off my noggin, tell me. By all means, tell me. Hope to hear from you soon. Mark. September 13th, 2004. From Country, Mark. Date. Monday, September 13th, 2004. 8.22 a.m. Subject free. A plan. Eric. Thanks again for calling. I got your email as well. And it mentions a few things we didn't discuss over the phone. So I want to add a comment or two. What I remember was about Travis told us that time he went went to pick up Drew and had to go up to his room to get him. This is the last time Drew gamed with us. Travis went upstairs to his room and the kid was pacing back and forth by his bed. Everything was all neat and tucked in. But a, the carpet was, t was worn in a line where Drew was pacing, like it's all he did. Yes, I remember this too, and the way Travis told the story, 
like he wanted it to sound funny, but he didn't believe it was. Dave laughed. He said, man, that dude's a broken record. <laughs> and we all agreed, nodding and chuckling. Fuck. We all just let it go at that. Like it was easier to write him off. But Travis was the last one to laugh. He's seen that room with his own eyes. No, oh, I really would, but Connie got sick last night and she's still throwing up this morning. I don't feel right leaving town with her like this. Understandable. You stay there. I'll continue to email you on this thing. I can't really talk about Drew with Jenny. She never knew him. She doesn't get why this is so disturbing, outside of the horror that took the place in Boozy. That's why I keep writing you. Nobody else gets it. Hey, maybe I'll somehow find Travis or Dave while I'm in town. M. September 14, 2004. From Condry, Mark. Date, Tuesday. September 14, 2004. 6.51 p.m. Subject, I made it. E. I made it to Houston. The drive was hell. Traffic and a persistent rattle in the trunk wore me down. The AC unit in my motel room sounds like a submerged Cessna engine. It will be hard for me to sleep with it on and impossible with it off. At least the whole internet access bit works and I'm able to check my email. Tomorrow's a long day. I'll be prowling Rayswood in your old neighborhood to zero in on an apartment complex I went to once. Joy, wish me luck. Mark. September 15th, 2004. From Country, Mark. Date, Wednesday, September 15th, 2004, 9.06 p.m. Subject, lots of stuff. Eric, great news. I have a solid lead. The whole day felt like I was pulling a string from the sand, but it's pointing me in the right direction. These emails are becoming more of a journal for me to help me log my progress. I hope you don't mind. It took me an hour of driving back and forth around the Gessner and Bracewood area before I zeroed in on the right side street. The landmarks had changed. I was 90% sure I found the right apartment complex, but I was still ga grasping air. There was no name for Drew's mom, and no guarantee her last was Hughes. Went to the manager's office, and I just got lucky. Her name is Nancy Hughes, and she stopped paying the rent in September 1999. Drew paid it for the rest of the lease's term, which ended the following February. According to the note in the resident file, he paid in cash. Seems mom moved out or just up and left one day. Poof. Andrew was living alone in the apartment then. How is he paying for rent with just a minimum wage job? I showed the manager an article about Andrew and then I lied. I said I was a private investigator. I don't know why. Maybe to justify why I was having her dig up rental information from five years ago. Anyway, she got off on it and kept rooting around in the Hughes file for me like a movie sidekick she found something a third party check covered rent for December of 98 Kurt Malone I'm thinking this is a step this is stepdad the manager photocopied the check for me and 10 minutes later I was calling the phone number printed with Kurt's address in upper left hand corner no luck there. Disconnected. So I took another approach and called 411 for local realtor service. You can do a research, you can do a search for contact information for a specific realtor. I remember hearing about this from a co worker who sold his place in Great Wood. Loan was listed under a, a little Remax affiliate office in Caddy. I got the number and called there. Left message. Evelyn, the owner, called me back and said Malone hasn't worked there in forever. He up and vanished, left her with all kinds of issues. She thinks he had financial problems and bailed from Mexico. I find it hard to swallow a theory she... 
uh, small theory told me th in stage whis whisper, but maybe that's just her personality. Still, that's two people gone. Before I thought maybe mom just moved in with stepdad. Now I don't know what the hell to think. The call went on for half an hour. As I got to hear the HR nightmare, Evelyn went through the thanks to Kurt's disappearance, halting his benefits, freezing the 401k, sorting documents to police, etc. I finally broke in and asked about the house, the one up out in West Houston he owned. She got very quiet after that. It took me another 10 minutes to answer her questions about who I was. This time I was honest and upfront with her. I guess it paid off because she believed me, or at least believed, in my intentions. She checked her records. I have an address, Eric. Kurt had his own home in Sugarland, But get this, he was renting a house from a client way out west, near Pecan Grove Plantation. Paperwork was curious, since he was supposed to be selling this place, but the previous owners had signed off on it in multiple places, like it, like it was no real conflict of interest. She didn't know what happened to the house after it was seized by the bank. I guess I'll find out tomorrow when I drive out there. I'm close, man. I'm real close. September 16th, 2004. Note, Mark was able to send text messages from his phone, but I frequently received them late. Sometimes hours after he sent them, as as is the case with the, sep with the September tw 21st messages. From removed at messaging.sprintpcs.com Date Tuesday, September 16th, 2004. 3.33 p.m. Subject, no subject. Where are you? Call me! From Conjuring Mark. Date, Thursday, September 16th, 2004, 8.25 p.m. Subject, the house. Holy fuck, I tried calling you five times today, but I got your machine. I really need to talk. Call me s soon as you can. Where do I start? The house is still there. It's this generic one-story thing. Bricks and siding. It must have been built at the same time as other homes in the neighborhood. But it just looks older. The roof is scarred in places. The driveway hasn't held up in others. I have cracks in the pavement. A plank is missing from the side gate. I rang the doorbell and figured I just talked to the real new owners. No one answered. Couldn't really hear if it worked or not. Blinds and, and curtains and windows kept me from peering inside. There was a dusty pickup truck with a warped front fender parked in the driveway. The neighbor across the street saw me checking out. He talked to me for a while as he watered his shrubs. He hasn't met the person who lives in the house now, or if anyone is living there really. He remembered Kurt, but not by name, just the guy who stayed there for a few months. The previous owner's Kurt clients didn't live there that much longer. He had all sorts of problems with the house, electrical, heating, that sort of thing. They moved out, left most of their furniture behind. And he said, packed into a big RV one day and just drove off. He still remembered their names, John and Lucy Mad Madsen. September 18th, 2004, from Condry, Mark. Date, September, uh, date, se Saturday, September 18th, 2004, 7.59 a.m. Hey, Eric, if you're pay playing phone tag when you called, I was already on the plane. And when I called back, I guess you were at the hospital again. Really sorry to hear about Connie. Any idea what it is yet? Food poisoning? Something else? What are the doctors saying? I'm in Boozy now. Yeah, I nabbed the ticket on short notice. I got on a stand standby. I left my car at the George Bush Airport in Houston. Jen freaked out when I told her. 
Then she got very terse, said I should do what will make me happy, and hung up. What will make me happy? Christ. I don't know a soul in Idaho. I haven't slept in two days. I'm charging everything to my visa. I have no idea how I'm going to pay it off. My watch stopped working yesterday. I got this weird ringing in my right ear. It comes and goes, annoying as hell. I'll tell you what will make me happy. Closing my eyes and not seeing Andrew staring back at me. What are you going to do when you get back, back there? Do you plan on telling the police the Madsen connection? Do you think the Madsons left something in that house that drove Drew nuts and he killed them for eight years later? Seriously, this is fucked up. Yeah, I don't know what to think. Right now, it's just a connection. They lived in the same house. The Madsons were there for, for four and a half months, and Drew was there for ten days. I have no idea what it means. I will email you, you when I fear something else. Out. I feel like I should pass this along to some people like to get you some help out there, or bring the feds or something. I don't know if anyone else has managed to make the connection you did, and it's an important one to the case. Can I forward your emails and contact info to someone? I was thinking about that but because I was going to ask you to do that for me at first. But now I don't think I'll get that kind of help I need. Let's face it, there are enough unexplainable pieces to this thing. I'm going to get two kinds of interests, nuts and skeptics. I wouldn't mind so much the skeptic, except I get this vision in my head of some guy calling Jenny calling my parents, calling my boss at work, looking to paint the picture of a guy who's lost his mind after hearing that his dead friend went nuts. I really have been totally honest with Jenny. I really haven't been totally honest with Jenny or my supervisor at the office because this is not something you can easily explain. I've been calling in sick to work. I told Jenny I had to go to Boozy to attend a, a pseudo-wake. I don't want to bite me in the ass. I, don't, I want that to bite me in the ass while I'm looking f into Andrew's past. Here's what you can do for me, though. You can hold on to this stuff as evidence or whatever if something crazy happens and I'm in trouble. Use this to explain the situation for me. Forward emails to my friends or family. Maybe if they read them, they'll understand what I'm going through. I know you didn't mean that to inherit this job. I'm sorry to make you do it. But I really appreciate the help. Mark and Potato Land. September 20th, 2004. Hong Country, Mark. Date, Monday, September 20th, 2004, 10.13 a.m. Subject, new lead. Update. I called the hospital. The one Andrew was taken back in August and asked some pointed questions about where Andrew's body went. Who picked it up? Did a relative or friend show up? The answer was no. But he was tagged with John and Lucy. And I kept demanding some sort of lead. So the intern gave me the names of relatives who were called in to confirm the IDs of the Madsons and to arrange for funeral home delivery. John's cousin lives out there. I'm going to head out and meet Craig Archer, the cousin and his wife. I'll write again from the Hotel M. From country, Mark. Date, Monday, September 20th, 2004, 10.40 p.m. Subject, the Archers. Back. That was strange. I met the Archers. I know what you said last time. I called how I need to stop lying because it'll make it harder on me later. But I wasn't about to tell them I'm a good friend of the guy who killed Greg's cousin. I said I knew the Madsons when they were in Houston. I had some burning questions about what happened to them, as I claimed they practically dropped off the map when they left town. I haven't heard from them since. Greg did most of the talking. His wife, Helen, was pleasant in that stiff smile way, but she found ways to interrupt my chat with Greg and remind him of other things he needed to get done. The more she did it, the more I encouraged Greg to keep chatting. The Madsons, as he tells it, had a long future plan in Houston. John got a transfer in Schlumberger oil and looked forward to setting, settling down. Then things started to go wrong after they moved in. 
Just little things that piled up. The car kept getting flat tires. Lucy broke her ring finger while fussing with the dishwasher. Trouble getting mail. Their phone got disconnected when they didn't pay the bill for two months. The bill that n they never got. That sort of thing. Finally, something Greg doesn't know what. It was enough to get them to put the house on the market the same week. John sold all of his company's stock, got it his 401k, quit his job, and put everything in a big RV. He and Lucy drove off to their new motor home and never looked back. They've been driving around the country for the last five years. Nomadic. Lucy got pregnant in the two, but miscarried. They still kept on the road. Greg thinks they would have kept driving through Idaho if the RV hadn't broke down with an AC problem. Greg says John called him up out of the blue and asked if he and Lucy could stay over. Greg made the guest room upstairs, and he and Helen welcomed them into their house for a week. There was this right before the shooting. This is where he gets stranger. Greg took me to the guest room and pointed to some spots on the carpet. Right in front of the closet door, furniture footprints. Like something had stood there. Greg said this is the dresser. The one against the opposite wall. They barricaded the closet door for the duration of their stay. It was the strangest thing. He also noticed they kept the bedroom light on around the clock. And bundled up the spare set of woolen blankets for the bed. Greg never... Never found the right way to ask no questions. I think he felt a little better talking to me about it. I'm not his cousin, but I'm someone who listened to him and agreed it was bizarre. I left Greg and Helen not feeling any better. I feel worse now. I ache the way, way you're sore right before you're, you get really sick. I'm trying to put things together. I really am. I have to go to police now, don't I? I go first thing in the morning. I promise. Eric. September 21st, 2004. Fun country, Mark. Date, Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 2.21 a.m. Subject, no subject. Hey. I just saw this thing on Discovery Channel. Probably a rerun. I bet you can catch it sometime. All about natural predators and stuff and wild things. Yeah, I'm up watching TV since I can't sleep. Anyway, they had this thing on the Venus flytrap talking about how it lures the curious insect to its lip. And then these invisible hairs or something since when one of the suckers lands on it and wham, it swallows the bug. Just like that on it, it spits out the skeleton of the fly and waits for the next victim. Some fly, sometimes the fly trap plants emit this odor to entice more food. Says the voice on the TV. The fancy name for them is Dionea Usipilia. So I wonder if that's all this is. This whole thing with the shooting, an anomalous article in Houston, and the footstep prints on the carpet, it's all to get me into the Venus flytrap. Only to send is a sweet sap, it's guilt. Guilt over all the times I was around Drew and didn't do anything to know anything, you know what I mean? And I'm flying all over the fucking country. And my head is buzzing, and I think I'm getting close to the truth. But really, I'm ticking, tickling some invisible hair, and the ground is about to fold up on me and swallow me down into the place where Nancy Hughes and Ken Malone went. I'm going to go take some sleeping pills. I hope Connie is getting better, man. I miss Jen. She has a way of making me feel like I'm at home just by being around her. I'm tired of motels. I'm sorry, Eric. I'm so sorry. M. From Condry, Mark. Date, Tuesday, September 21st, 2004. 12.15 p.m. Eric, bingo. I went to the police and asked to talk to Lieutenant Perez. 
Instead, I got Detective Slockoff. Sockcloth. He said he was working the Hughes case now. I'm more inclined to think he was just running interference for Perez, in case I was a wacko. Anyway, I told him about the Ma Madsen connection with Andrew, see if that would help. He said they looked into it. Then he started off with questions about me, and looked for a way to cut the chat short. Police stations make me uncomfortable. The rest of the talk was rather banal. But at the end of it, almost offhandedly, he asked if I wanted it to sign for Andrew's personal effects. Since they had copies of all the important stuff, I said sure, even though it made me feel like I've already written off the off this case. Drew's been busy the last four years. He has driver's licenses for Kansas, Colorado, Arizona, California, and Idaho. Looks like he stayed at friends' homes because none of the addresses <laughs> printed on the licenses have apartment numbers. His Idaho license is, is just two months old and has his address of the rental home where he stayed. I'm going to drop by this afternoon and see what happened to his things there. Maybe there's a clue to, to how he knew where to find the Madsons or why he shot them. Perez or someone has done this already, I'm certain. But I'm not sure he looked very far. Wish me luck, Mark. From removed at messaging.sprintpcs.com Date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.14 p.m. Subject, no subject. Standing in front of the house now. It's the same one. The Houston house. Same marks on the roof, same fence damage. From remove messaging sprintpcs.com Date, Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.22 p.m. Subject, no subject. Just talked to old man across the street. He says the house has been here for years. Rented out as far back as he can remember. From removed messaging sprint pcs dot com. Date Tuesday, September twenty first, two thousand four, four twenty five p.m. Subject no subject. I rang th the doorbell. No answer. It's exactly the same, Eric. I don't understand. From removed messaging sprint pcs dot com. Date Tuesday, September twenty first, two thousand four, four twenty nine p.m. Subject no subject. Ears ringing again. I don't know what to do. How is it the same? From remove messaging sprintpcs.com. Date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.33 p.m. Subject, no subject. There's a way into the house. Here. From removed messaging sprintpcs.com. Date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.33 p.m. Subject, no subject. Where are you? Pick up the phone. From remove messaging, sprintpcs.com. Date, Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.38 p.m. Subject, no subject. I'm going inside. From removed messaging at sprintpcs.com. Date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.41 p.m. Subject, no subject. Inside the house. Nobody's here. Air is cold. Metal smell. From removed messaging sprintpcs.com. Date, Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.41 p.m. Subject, no subject. I found stairs going up. Didn't see second story from street. From remove messaging sprintpcs.com. Date, Tuesday, 21st, 2004, 4.47 p.m. Subject, no subject. Did you call? Signal bar, signal cuts off. Three bars, then no bars. 
I'm looking for more, more of Drew's stuff here. Layout is really bizarre. Lots of rooms. From removed messaging, sprint to PCS.com. Date, Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.47 p.m. Subject, no subject. Door at, door at the end of the hall. Made of metal. Check in other rooms instead. From removed messaging, sprint to PCS.com. Date, Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 5.05 p.m. Subject, no subject. Cow! From Remove Messaging Sprint, PCS.com. Date, Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 5.09 p.m. Subject, no subject. Found something! Drew's backpack! Get it out of here now! From Remove Messaging Sprint, PCS.com. Date, Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 5.11 p.m. Subject, no subject. I think someone's here! I just heard something. From removed messaging sprint to PCS.com. Date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 577 p.m. Subject, no subject. The door is open. 927, 2004. Mark. Date Monday. September 27th, 2004, 1.18 p.m. Subject for Thursday. Hello, Eric. This is Jennifer. I'm on Mark's PC now. I did like you suggested, and I looked through his outbox, and I don't see any emails about this to anyone else. There aren't that many, really. You didn't tell me a lot of this stuff, Eric. Like now, I'm reading the last thing he sent to you back on the 13th. I didn't know he was so emotional. Why didn't you tell me about this? But anyway, like he said, he wrote to you from his laptop when he was in Houston and in Boise. And then the police up there said that he, f they found that he, w in his hotel room, and they're taking their own sweet time checking it out for clues. So yeah, I'll keep asking for that to be sent down. Where else should I look? I don't know what else to do here, except wait until you come down and look at it. It does have AIM, but I can't tell where the chat logs would be saved or anything. If he does that, please tell me what else I can do. You know more about what he was up to than anyone else. Because of his old friend, the two of you had who went crazy, and now Mark is missing for almost a week. Please send me the other emails he sent you. Please, I want to know, I want to know now. Jen. October 1st, 2004. From Postmaster. Date, Friday, October 1st, 2004, 1.30 p.m. Subject, undeliverable mail. Unknown user, X. Recipient to general following response, 550 unknown user. Original message follows from x at x dot x. Date Friday, October 1st, 2004, 1247 p.m. Subject, no subject. Human armor and leg up bones found its... Oh, wait, hold on. Hold on. Human arm and leg bones found at scene on street. Scottsdale residents are got a shock at the start of their morning commute when they found what this what seems to be human bones lying on on the road at Sear Drive. Crime scene technicians arrived within half an hour and began to sweep the scene for more evidence that might help identify this human victim or at least if so an approximate time of death. Police spokesman Danielle Swift Said bone evidence alone isn't usually enough to determine identity or even cause of death. These remains didn't just appear on the road. They were they were moved here, Swift said. Therefore, we're asking any witnesses to contact the police with information that might pertain to what happened. No other evidence was found along Sage Street or in yards of neighboring homes. More of the story as it develops.
Who? Whoever you are, whatever you are, fuck you. I may not know you, but I can tell what this is, and I'm not fooled. Your Venus flytrap game won't work. I'll make damn sure to warn Jenny and the others, too, so nice try. But no one is falling for your bait this time. It stops here. Updates. Updates. It has been painfully obvious that although I want this to end, for all of us to have closure regarding Mark's disappearance, the trail he left has raised too many unanswered questions. Since the time I first published this site for Jen and those close to Mark, new information continues to arrive from a variety of sources. In my last posted email, I refused to take the bait. I said it would stop here, but it doesn't stop there. Not by any stretch. This page will chronicle my findings and other resources as I discover them. Some may have no connection to how or why Mark vanished. Only time will tell. A final note for those of you like Sandra and Nathan Condry. The truth is, I don't yet know what to believe for this whole thing. But I know what I don't want to believe. October 14th, 2004. Jen called. She spoke with Boise police again yesterday. And they finally agreed to ship down the laptop. Once she gets it and looks at it herself, she sent it my way. If I find anything new, I'll add it here. October 17th, 2004. Among the spam today, I have received this email from someone who seems to have stumbled upon the site. From Mr. Paranoia, subject, the house. Very interesting. If it's real, I have some information for you. I don't know, Mark, but I, but that won't matter. Once I send you this link, based on what I've researched, those who have figured out what this fly trapped house is risk becoming its next victim. Not everyone is eaten by it. Such them, maybe. Some may just not be psychologically susceptible to it. The way some aren't able to be hypnotized, but if you walk away knowing too much about it, the house will get to you. Sooner or later, witnesses, witness the Madsons. Maybe you don't want to know anything else. Well, regardless of how I feel about it, this site isn't for me, so in case you read it here first, send me what you have and I'll decide if I want to share it, Mr. Paranoia. Also, don't expect me to publish your messages to me ever again. I am not a PR firm. October 22nd, 2004. After trading an email several times with Mr. Paranoia, he finally sent me the link mentioned in the October 17th email. Jen, I've already, I've read it already, and I want you to treat it as a hoax. Unless you get something in the mail from a grocery store in Arizona, call me when you've read it and we'll talk. It's a live journal site, which means to read it chronologically, you need to scroll to the bottom of the page and work your way up. The journal is authored allegedly a 16-year-old named Daniela Stevens. Alright. So, before getting into the story, I am going... Cause I am going to read the link, because the link actually still works. 2004. I haven't been paying attention to these dates. Yes, it's still 2004. Anyways. 10.21 p.m. New job. Hi, everybody. Especially Jonathan. XOXO. Here we go. It's Danny's first LJ. Hehe. <laughs> well, it took me long enough. I just need a reason for one. My life is pretty boring for the most part, so trying to keep a diary... Going felt like too much work. But whenever, whenever I get a job, like over the summer, I've always have these great stories to tell. 
like when I worked as a lifeguard for the Highland YMCA Outdoor Pool or at the public library last year. You wouldn't think you'd meet so many weirdo people or end up on crazy adventures like raccoon hunting with a drain net. Hee <laughs> hee. But it happens all the time to me. Well, this time, I will make sure to write them down here because I have a new job. That's right. It's all part of Danny's genius plan to pay for Xmas. I want to get my friends and family nice things this year. So I took a babysitting job at a house three blocks away. Babysitting, yeah. Doesn't sound like a steady job, but this one's different. The Ellisons are both full-time working parents, programmers at some tech company downtown. With big deadlines get close, both of them have to work hella bad OT hours. And I need someone to watch their daughter, Lenny, from 5 to 10, Monday through Thursday. That seriously cuts into my downtime after school. Sad face. But it's worth it. I keep telling myself that. I went over tonight and met Liney and Mr. and Mrs. Ellison. They look like total geeks. Their living room is has a big screen TV and also a table with two PCs and a bunch of other gear like DVD burners. The place is cold. They must run the AC a lot to keep their hardware from overheating. It's like that in the school computer room all the time. Lenny is eight. She's quiet and shy, but she has the cutest crooked teeth smile. She likes Nintendo and Barbie. I think we'll get along fine. My first day is tomorrow. It's so weird to have someone else's else's house key on my key ring. I guess my references were good for them, though. Wish me luck. Wish me luck. XO, XO, Danny. 10.55 p.m. First night. Woo, I'm back. First night babysitting was easy. I got there a little before five and met Kathy. She's the one who takes Lenny home from school. She has a boy who goes there too. She knew Mi Mr. and Mrs. Ellison when they lived in Chicago and helped them find a place here. She was in a hurry, I guess, but it seems kind of rude. She told me to be on time so I don't have to wait for you. Sad face. I was on time. I was early. Lenny was still very quiet, but she doesn't know me, so that's okay. We played some Nintendo, and after dinner, she wanted to play house. She has a dollhouse in her room. It's really cute. I grabbed the Barbie doll and started to play with her, but she told me Barbie wasn't the right size for the house. Hehe. <laughs> it's true, too. Barbie is just way too tall. See that? See what long leg gets you sometimes? But Lenny doesn't have any dolls for the house. She says it doesn't need any because it's just a house. But I think she secretly wants some. If we get along, I might add that to my Danny Xmas list project. Hehe. <laughs> Gotta remember to take a jacket with me next time, though. It gets way too cold and I didn't find the thermostat. I was going to say something with Lenny's mom and dad came home. But they showed up and, and they looked so tired. I didn't know how they how they worked with such crazy hours. I just got my money and told them I'd be there tomorrow. That was it. Pretty uneventful first day. So sleepy now. Off to bed. XO, XO, Danny. Oh, I forgot to read the current move from last one. The current move from last one is bouncy. This one is sleepy. 10.34 p.m. Bizarre. Tonight was pretty bizarre. Lenny spent most of it in her room playing quietly, which was okay for me since I had to finish my Amer history paper. I made her soup for dinner and checked on her from time to time, but when I, it got closer to bedtime, I heard her talking to someone. So I went to, back to see if she was calling to me or just chatting with her dolls. She isn't supposed to be on the phone. She was moving furniture around in her little house, just talking to herself. I think she was repeating stuff she heard over her she overheard somewhere, maybe even in a house. You know how kids say stuff they don't realize could get their parents in trouble. I think Lenny was whispering, Come on, Rick, answer the phone and the door. Surprise face. Um Miss Ellison, maybe seeing Rick on the side? When I tucked Lenny in the bed, 
in bed. I asked her what she was saying before. She just shrugged and said it was stuff she heard. When I asked where she heard them, she said, around. We'll see if the plot thickens tomorrow night. Happy face. Off to bed now, Danny. Current mood, confused. Eleven o two p.m. Crooked. Oh, and she, Lenny is such a strange little girl. Last night it was a weird, it was weird faces. Tonight it was a rhyme or some children's song. Something about a crooked man with six pa uh, pants. I don't know. I mean, she can be cute and smiles a lot, but sometimes I worry she doesn't get enough attention from her parents. Well, duh. Otherwise, I wouldn't have this job. Tongue, tongue out emoji. She wanted to go to bed early tonight. I tucked her in and she hugged me. I kept her arms around me for so long. Sad face. She's definitely going to get an Xmas present from me, even if I'm not her sitter by then. I told her a story to put her to sleep about a family of bears in a big house. I was using her dollhouse as one where the bears live, you know, just improvising. So I looked over at it and saw she had a colored a room upstairs, a red, and marked it up in magic marker. I asked her what the room was, and she just said, said, the one upstairs. Why is it red? Lenny just shrugged like she didn't know. What's it for? It smells like cookies and candy. See what I mean? Strange, strange, strange. No idea what that's about. Oh, I almost forgot on my way back to the living room. I found a set of keys on the floor in the hall. Just lying there. I was like, what the fuck? They weren't mine, and the house keys didn't work on the doors for the house. I don't know how I missed them before. I think they belong to Rick. <laughs> anyway, they have one of those grocery keychain cards on them, so I took them. Maybe I should hand them over to Mrs. and Mrs. Ellison. But what if I'm right and the mom is having an affair, and these are to her boyfriend's place? I don't want to get anyone in trouble. This weekend, I'm going to go to the store and have them scan a little key card for me to see who it is. I'll be a good Samaritan and nosy at the same time. John's little brother sacks at the one on Camelback, I think. <sighs> what a week. Finally, I get a week into myself, though. Alright, if I find anything juicy about the keys. XO, XO, Danny. Current mood, curious. 11, 10 a.m. Keys. Well, that was a letdown. Okay, so I went to went and had a kitchen carts thing scanned at the fries, which I worked, even though they they were for another place, cause it's all part of the big chain of stores. The keys don't belong to anyone named Rick. That after all, the guy told me they're for somebody named Mark Hundry, I think it was. He lives in Texas. I didn't get them back either. It's possible to have them have the store mail them back. Whatever. So it makes me wonder what in the world they were doing in Mr. and Mrs. Ellen's hall. Hmm. Lol, listen to me. I'm like Nancy Drew. Okay, off to the mall. John is waiting. XOXO, Danny. Current mood, curious. Ten thirty one p.m. Back on the job. What a weekend. Let's see. I hung out with John. Saw... That movie about those South Park guys and went lipstick shopping because I read this article how lipstick is all undervalued now. Like someone doesn't wear it as often. And I love lipstick. Rebel. Tonight was pretty boring. Lenny was her usual quiet self and spent most of the night watching TV. We watched Aladdin twice and then it was bedtime. The house wasn't cold this time. Maybe that it wasn't that bad since I bought a jacket and kept it on. Oh, I burned dinner. Surprise face. That was frustrating because I know I said it for the right time. So I made us PB&J sandwiches instead. I'm such a mom. Not joking about that. I'm going to tell y'all this one weird part when I was cleaning up in the kitchen after putting Lenny to bed. I heard what sounded like someone barreling down the stairs. Only there was no stairs in Ellison's house. I think it was just a TV or some garage door. Just 
makes a sound like that, because the Ellisons came a few minutes later. Boy, they look tired. They could have used a, a couple of Danny specials, PP and Jace themselves. I still don't know if I should mention finding the keys that belong to that Mark guy or not. Anyway, time for bed. Danny. Current mood, sleepy. 10.48 p.m. Why am I doing this again? Bleh. I don't feel good. Sad face. I've had a headache for the, for half the night, just pounding on the back of my eyes. I've taken like four Advil already, and it won't go away. Babysitting was a nightmare. I had two papers to write, plus literary homework. Plus, Tuesdays are workout days for me, but I got up late and couldn't work out in the morning, so I sort of squeezed in a quick 20-minute session after school. Oh, gee, Lenny kept singing that stupid rhyme all night and drove me nuts. I swear, if I hear it one more time, I'll snap. I had such a hard time with everything tonight. The house got really cold at one point, made my ear ring. You know that high-pitched sound like they use for the test of the emergency broadcast system? Yeah, my ear was doing that. I thought it was the computers at first. Did I tell you about the PCs in the living room? Anyway, they they are always on. I went over and checked them out. The table is like a spaghetti bowl of cables leading off behind furniture or into the wall. Turns out it's not them. The ringing was in my ear, but the Ellisons had some sort of monitoring program going. All these numbers were scrolling like mad on a, in a window. The program wasn't anything I recognized, but the file name was like TMP test slash underscore attic. I didn't want to get in trouble, so I didn't touch them. It got warm in the hall. Lenny and I stayed there for a while. It also smelled good there, like a bakery. I think the vents might be messed up in the house. Seriously, I don't know how anyone can live like that all the time. Sad face. I want to quit, but I don't want to hurt Lenny's feelings. Maybe I should suck it up. God, there goes that ringing again. Current mood, drain. Eleven thirty-one p.m. Home finally. It's taken me this long to feel good enough to type. I got home over an hour ago. If last night was awful, tonight was a hundred times worse. I don't know where to start. I got there at five. Waved by to Kathy. Played with any some. TV was acting up, so we had dinner early. Made some raviolis with pasta sauce, and it was good. But when I was taking Lenny's plate, I thought I felt something touch me. It made me jump, and the bowl spilled onto Lenny's shoulder. She had pasta sauce in her air. She asked for a bath, which was fine, but I had not given her a bath before. I was a little uncomfortable because I wasn't familiar with the temp settings on the tub. I didn't know how Lenny's mom and dad would feel about it, but Lenny kept pleading with me to stay with her for the bath, so I ran the water and helped me help her into the tub. String came out of the faucet and the tub filled up. It made Lenny nervous. I tried to tug on it, pulled it all the way out, but it must have caught something inside the pipes. It just dangled from the faucet and floated in the water. Some of the pasta sauce had gotten into Lenny's hair, so I rinsed it out a little. There wasn't any soap in the guest bath, so I went to Ellison's bedroom and brought some brought from the master bath. That's when Lenny started screaming. I've never been so chilled to the bone for hearing her tonight. It was horrible hearing her scream. I turned and ran back to her as fast as I could, and when I got back, she was hanging on the edge of the tub trying to get out. The string wrapped around her leg. It yanked and yanked at it, at it again, but it wouldn't budge. And Lenny kept screaming, get it off, get it off. And I started to try to unwind it from her leg. The shampoo in the water or something, it made it slippery. And, it start, and I started crying and suddenly, string went slack. I tore Lenny away. She had a set of mark on her like stripes. Where the string had cut into her skin. Later, there, when I went back with a pair of scissors, the string was gone. The water had drained away. We spent the rest of the night in the living room on the couch, piled under two blankets and pillows from the Ellison's bed. Lenny eventually fell asleep, but I was worried about her and confused about what happened. I was a nervous wreck 
at around 9 p.m., one of the PCs started beeping like crazy. I got up and checked on it. An alert had popped up. It said like that. Then the power cut out and back on again. Only some of the lights didn't come on, just light down the hall. In the hall, it was easier to see, but... I took a wrong turn on the way back, and the tiny hall and door leads to the garage was not where I thought it was. Instead, I found a set of stairs, like real stairs, going up. It smelled like cake, like right out of the oven. I was so lost and strange. I can't explain it, except I didn't think the house had a second story. It's too hard to see from outside. I finally found my way into the kitchen, and from there I went back to Lenny, who was still asleep. It got really cold after that. When the Elsons got home, I told them about the bath and other problems, but I didn't mention the stairs. Then I told them I couldn't babysit anymore. I think I used schoolwork as an excuse. They said they understood, but I could tell they were depressed about it. I'm sorry, but I just can't keep doing it. Well, Miss Ellison asked me to please just make it for one more night, and then they would get a new sitter over the weekend to start on Monday. She paid me in advance for tomorrow, too. I didn't want to say yes. I don't want to go back, but I felt so bad for leaving him on a short, short notice. And really, what if it's just me being a spaz? Sad face. Like I'm freaking myself over something. Anyway, I told Miss Ellison, yes. One more night, I can do this. I will come back and I'll and tell you about the final five hours sitting, sitting for Lenny in that house. And come Friday, I'll talk about something new. Like my friends Don and Kim, or how I love Starbucks strawberry cream fraps, or whatever. Just keep me in the habit of writing here. I think I've gotten pretty good about it anyway. I sort of get on and start typing automatically before I go to bed. Okay, okay, I wish I wasn't so scared of going back. I feel so empty. Danielle. Current mood. Numb. Eleven forty one PM there was a crooked man and he walked a crooked mile. He found a crooked sixpence upon a crooked stile. He bought a crooked cat, he caught a crooked mouse, and they all lived together in a crooked little house. Red Rover, Red Rover, let Jenny come over. Wednesday, october twentieth, two thousand four. Two o'clock PM Found you. Thursday, October 21st, 2004. Sunday, 31st, 2004. And that's the it of that link. So back to the story. October 26, 2004. Jen, please call me back. I know it must be driving you crazy, but do not go to Phoenix. Mark was never there, despite what Postmark says on that box. The keys are just like the article about Andrew. Bait. Please, please don't do this. Send me the laptop and we'll figure, this out, figure it out together, okay? I won't have to put this here if, you, if you'd answer your phone. I know you visit this page regularly. Call me. 10 October 26, 2004. Late. Lots of responses. I didn't expect this. Thank you for your support and your technical notes. At this time, I cannot involve and will not involve anyone else for a number of reasons. Please respect my decision on this matter. I'll keep the contact information and the paranormal investigators for the paranormal investigators and I'll continue to help those close to Mark as best as I can. Please, no more phone calls. Connie. It's going out of her mind. Thank you. October 27th, 2004. Sandra slash Nathan. Check your email. I finally heard back from Sprint PCS service representative today. No more account authorization hassles. He said the records show that have been billed for, for only for 14 text messages on Mark's phone on September 21st. The last one timestamp at 5.11 p.m. He's sending me a copy of the logs, but I'm not sure... If they'll do us any good at this point, I'm waiting a laptop now. October 28th, 2004. I've been contacted by Diane M., who says 
she was friends with Lucy Madsen. She lived at Houston. Hello, Eric. A friend linked me to the site asking if this was the same Lucy I knew when I lived in Sugarland. After doing some reading, I convinced it is. I had no idea what happened to her. After she and John moved, Lucy and I met through a little book club. Some mutual friends started up. We were both avid readers. Yes, she and John had all sorts of unexplainable problems with that house. I remember seeing some of them firsthand, like the leak. After reading about your friend Mark, I stood up a bit and called, then called up my father. I often talked with Lucy on AIM, but she lived here, and I thought maybe some of those old dialogues would be of use to you. But they would have been my old PC, which I gave to my dad. Oh, a year ago. I went over earlier tonight and dug through the program files, files for any sign of my AIM chats with Lucy. Way back when, Dad had removed a lot of stuff. He deletes things. But I did find a scrap from February 1999. It's the one I remembered. The one that made me curious to visit. Note, I don't really think it's a supernatural thing. I'm more prone to think Lucy had some sort of nervous breakdown and created or imagined traumatic moments in the house. The rest of it, like your friend's experience, I can't explain, but I hope you find closure soon. The attachment would, wouldn't open, but hopefully Diane will try again. Update, I got the chat log converted it to HTML. I don't know if Diane is still using her screen name, or if Lucy is taken by a new user now, so to protect both from unwarranted IMs, I removed the numbers of the ends of their nicks. If there are any users with the nicks in this log, they are not the same people, FYI. Let's see if this works. Nope. That link does not work. Oh well. October 29th, 2004. Laptop arrived. There's a lot of lot to sort through here. Most notably, some pictures Mark must have downloaded from his camera phone. But his laptop was e wasn't equipped with Photoshop or any other photo app, so I can't see more than thumbnails. I'll move them to my hard drive along with recent files and see what I could find. Also, it's crunch time at the office, so I'll be working this weekend, FYI. Maybe we could all use a little mental break from this. October 31st, 2004. Hooray for automated FTP uploading. It seems this publication, it means I'm still not back from my trip in, to the never-ending suburban grid in the valley. Consider it, it a precautionary update. When I return, I will remove this link, and since I can't stand sounding like some sort of martyr, nor do I like to cause a panic, in the meantime, in case it would wind up being important, I've been keeping a personal blog on a remote host. Don't worry about me, Connie. I'm sure I'll have quite a story to tell. Love, E. October 1st, uh, 4th, 2005. This is Connie. It's been nearly one year since Eric drove off and never came back. I don't know how to do HTML. I don't know if this is how Eric did things. I'll be good doing. I'll be doing good just to copy this page back onto the website. What happened in a year? A lot. Not enough. I don't have any answers. Just a million questions. Let's see. I met Jennifer and Rachel, who's Cam's girlfriend. The three of us still kept in touch. Legally, Eric. And Mark and Cam are considered missing. That makes some things very hard on us. What else? I have a mountain of files, emails, letters, digital photos that may or may not not have anything to do with their disappearance. Every time I try to start in it, start in, I get overwhelmed. So last week, I hired someone to go through all of it for me and see if anything made sense. The reason I'm finally learning this thing is that he f 
has found one or two pieces to this puzzle, and I feel a responsibility to continue what ha my husband began. This is a test post later this week. After I hear back from Jenny, I will post more information. XOC. October 12th, 2005. Well, for one reason or another, the new information is yet to be verified. So until I hear back from my source, I can't post a link. Now I can get how hard this is. You never know who is on the other end of a modem. Thanks for your patience. I love you, all three of you who are still reading. X zero C. October fourteenth, two thousand five. Despite the fact that sh she just used her diary to lash out at me instead of answering me privately, I will link to a live journal of a woman who claims to know about what both Mark and Eric were investigating. Edit. Okay, I'm still figuring out the link thing. The blog of Lauren Mathers. Hoping that works. X0C. And it does work. So we got more story. So that was the end of that. So let's listen to the journal. I'm back. January 17th, 2006. Oh, wait. Hold on. Oh, yeah. I gotta read backwards. I'm sorry. You must hear the, hear the truth. August 16th, 2005. 12.40 p.m. My name is Lauren Ma Mathers. And I don't know much about the internet. And I don't care to. The reason I am this so-called internet diner in old downtown. I ain't about to tell you which city. Thank you kindly. Sorry about that. Is because there's no record of what I did in October of 2001. Not anymore. I killed a man. Killed him dead. Thing of it was, he was trying to kill me first. I don't take too kindly to that sort of behavior. At the time, I was in another state from one of my last known address. A tourist. Never mind, I had all my shit in the back of my station wagon. And a revolver in my glove box. To anyone else, I was a visitor from out of town. So was the man I shot to death. He wasn't local either. See, we both were from Mosey. There was a trial. There were lawyers and all that shit. And I would have been happy to serve my time in the cell for what I'd done. One of the safest places for me would be considering what I know. But the damn lawyer got me up on the chair next to the judge asked me why I did what I did, and I told him. I told all of them I went on for 11 pages in the court transcripts, laying out everything I know about it. And my big mouth j got me just nine months in a mental facility. Nine months. Like my delusion was a pregnancy. And once I had it out of me, I could go free out among the world. Now I'm out. Been out for f for a few years. I still carry a gun on me too. And I'm not afraid to kill again if cornered. Maybe I've walked right past you. But I guarantee you didn't pay a cent of attention to me. And that is the way I like it. I would have stayed that way. Never go into one of those coffee places with computers hooked up on the tables like they were Jetsons. Because anyone who wanted to know the truth... Just had to read the court transcripts. It was all there. But they're gone. Disappeared from Boozy Police. Man named Mark Country came looking for them. Then calling for me. That's how I know. Used to be you. Could type my name into the search engine. And things like wa Wahoo. And my name w would get you these news stories about shooting in Salt Lake City. Now there's nothing. Well, I aim to put a stop to that. I'm going to tell you what happened. And also what happened to the fellow Mark. And a, a slew of other names you may not recognize. The first thing I can tell you is this. They aren't houses. Stop thinking of them like houses. Soon as I get a panhandle enough money for another hour on this bitch box, I'll be back. L.M. 
New Town St. Lorraine. September 20th, 2005, 11.33 p.m. All it took was one entry on this journal thingy, and I had a man in a sweat sweatsuit come trolling down town for me. It took me a, a good week to make sure I had shaken him loose. Now I'm in a different place, New Jetson Cafe, and I got a new shopping cart from Target down the street. It's a good cart. Got smooth wheels, no pulling to the left or right, no squeaking. I just need to find a good place to sleep tonight. So about booze, we... I best get to to that now before someone finally catches up to me. And now it's really just a matter of time before I, I'm i dragged through the front door of a house that smells like fresh bread and warm blood. But as I said, they aren't houses. Here's what I know and what I said to everyone in the courtroom. It started with the little things. This was a week after I moved in, summer before my first semester teaching. The sound traveled in odd ways, especially in the kitchen. No echo, even in empty rooms. Now and then I felt... Now and then I thought I felt the carpet wriggle under my feet. The outlet things, they felt... I don't know how to put it. I guess soft is the word. Like I was jamming that plug into a jar of jelly. Flutter, power fluttered a lot, but damaged if I could find a fuse box. Thermostat didn't seem to care how much how I fussled with it. The air just came on when I wanted it to. It was the time it was warm and smelled like cinnamon toast. All of this feels par for the, for the course when you buy a home at auction. I got in on one of those deals where the bank offloads all the real estate they reclaimed from defaulted loans or some shit. You get what you pay for? Not this time. Not even close. I try again into the attic to see if there's anything like a fuse box there. I search all up and down the house for a trap door to the cross space. No sign of it anywhere. So I did what any... Any self-respecting middle-aged one would do. I went out and bought an axe. As soon as I jammed the axe into the hall ceiling, it all started going to hell. Shit, internet cafe guy is shooting me off. Be back when I can. Continue from last entry. October 4th, 2005. 8.21pm. Let's try this again. Last two times I got on here, I was halfway through typing new entry when I got kicked out for smelling bad. But late last night, I stuck into a condo, took a bath on their rooftop pool, and changed into fresh clothes, clothes and bought. I bought at a thrift store. Getting right back to it, the house bled. Not like red human blood, but something else. It got into my eyes when I chucked that axe into the ceiling. Went to the kitchen and wiped my eyes with a towel. When I went back to the hall, the trap door had suddenly opened from the ceiling and a set of steps of stairs extended to the floor. Like I, I had a whole second level or something. I couldn't see up past the threshold. Not because of the angle, but because it was so damn dark. At first I thought something black and large was blocking. The way up, but it wasn't an object. The smell was most bizarre, a thick, heavy scent of sweets and baked goods, and I was trying desperately to draw out the stench of rotting meat. Made me quincy, queasy. And I wanted to go up there. No, that's not entirely true. I didn't want to go, but at the same time, I had this urge to step up the stairs. Like, that's what happens next. I needed to keep going, maybe just poke my head in and look around in all that dark. I started arguing with myself about it. And by the time I finally listened to the scream in my head, I was already two steps off the floor. I turned and ran fast as I could for the front door. The hall was making these weird noises overhead, and the walls crack crackled like I was in an old clipper, clipper ship out at sea. The knob on the door wouldn't turn, and my heads were all sweaty by now. I tried kicking at the goddamn thing, but it was no use. The door would not open. Behind me, I heard these loud sound like a chorus of fat men sucking on their teeth. It came from somewhere in the middle of the house. I wasn't going to try and 
past the stairs to the sliding back door in the back. It was out front or not at all. I grabbed the chair from the little dining area and bashed it against the picture window and looked out the front yard. Let me tell you, I swung that thing like the bases were loaded. I am no wimp. I once took down a f guy a full foot taller than me outside a bar. And that was when I was a little tipsy. But damn if that but damn if that window didn't break. Here's what it did. It stenched. Stretched. It stretched like it was made of see-through skin. That skin bounced back and cracked me in the skull hard. And I was left bleeding from my scalp. A real gusher. The carpet in the living room started swaying like it was grass and a breeze. And the smell started filling up with up the front of the half of the house, making me wonder why I didn't walk up the stairs in the first place, making me think the best bet now was to go up and see if there's a way out from the attic. And it took some miracle for me to find my way to the kitchen with a bloody face, hands scrambling for the towel again. What I found was a bread knife, those serrated ones with a fork end. I made it like I was going back to the living room, then dove at the window again, screaming like a banshee, and and I fell right onto the porch outside. It was like the window just opened up ahead for me. The knife was Moses, and the glass was the fucking Red Sea. That's how I remember it, stone cold truth. What really did the trick was what I found when I went back two days later. Formulas. October 11th, 2005. 10.46 a.m. Vomit notes. If body fresh, eaten by house less than 12 hours. Strings attached. If body cooked, inside mouth for more than 24 hours. No strings visible. If body stale, too long time inside mouth. Bones. Physical strings range small just within the house. Can't go outside. Very, very fast movement. No strings able to go outside. Perform basic tests, slower used as lure or bait. Bones digested in fluid for too long, or house gets hungry. Warning signs open sore or nape of neck. Last string disconnects from there. Repeat repeats phases. Unusually strong or weak. Connection theory. Eventually all same house. T slash S anomaly. Multidimensional. Beyond human understanding. For Connie, October 13, 2005. Well, I was going to pick up where I left off last week, but I had to wait through four email from some woman before I could get here. I don't have time to respond to all of them. This bitch botch costs me money. Money I, I should be spending on booze or coffee. My lifeblood. Look, Connie, or whoever you are, I don't give a shit if you believe me or not. It's not my mission to validate my existence for you or your little project. Yes, I did talk to Mark Condry. I'm getting to that. As for proof of whatever you're looking for from me, did you not read the bottom entry here? The proof is gone. I can't even prove if I was a resident in Idaho anymore. Either you believe me or you don't. Pull up a link if you want to. Get the word out. Let people decide for themselves. No way in hell am I going to meet you somewhere. I didn't survive this long by being stupid. If you want, I can describe Mark for you. I can do that much. I'll send you that your way. As for my last entry with the formulas, I just want to get that written down before I forget. I'll talk about that more later. Some of it is speculation. Some of it I've seen with my own eyes. I'm not playing tic-tac-toe, so none of this is exo shit. LM. I'm back. January 17th, 2006. 11.46 p.m. Three months and five states later, I got news, kitties. So sit down and hear me out. Okay, first off about what I was saying earlier. Before that woman contacted me and I suddenly got popular. I mean, about my house. You know, that was my house. Maybe that's just how we Americans operate. But once I put a payment on anything, that sucker's mine. So after two days, I done came up with a few conclusions. 
The first of which was, I didn't really see what I thought I saw. It was a monoxide leak, or I got sloshed and had some episode. Two days in a motel was plenty for me to work up the old courage to go back. Somebody was living in the house, in my house. Two somebody's turned out, twin brothers, my stuff was there. At least the furniture, I could see it through the windows. But they were living it up like nothing was wrong. The window I thought was busted through was replaced and everything looked almost normal. But damn, if you don't know what to do when you come home and find two strangers living in your home, I wasn't even bothered that, that they could be out and out to kill me or something. You know what worried me? That they were going through my stuff, putting their grubby paws all over my music, CDs, my underwear, sleeping under my covers. Damn it. I would have stayed outside just watching them move around like shadows behind the drapes, but then this nest of blackbirds made a racket fly flying out of the little elm tree in the front yard, and I could see those twins in the window staring at me. Then the front door opened like someone was finding me inside, but no one was there. And someone in the worrying brain said, No monoxide leak, no drunken nightmare, move your ass. So I listened and I bailed. I left my CDs and my clothes and my fucking house behind. A few months later, one of the brothers found me in Utah, and I had to kill him dead. Now I, had, I got some out of that out of the way, I need to tell you important information. Enough of the history, I'm your secret agent out in the field, getting you the files you need to stay alive. Theory, somebody had to start building these things, right? I started sniffing around, here's what I found out. Get your pencils out. Near as I can tell, the original designer of the floor plans was a man named Jared Lewis. He tore down his old house in Topeka and built a new one on top of the foundation. Family left him at some point in the process. Okay, but there's more. Lewis was an old student or disciple of some nut named Jack Pier Parsons. Man, oh man, is there a ton of background on Parsons. Too much to go into here, but this Lewis guy went after his home building project like he was a land-based Noah. So I'm still collecting information on his Jared Lewis and his little group of followers. I should also have some goodies like an actual floor pan, maybe some photos of the house, assuming I get up the courage to visit one in the city where I'm squatting now. Damn, gotta go talk more later. And that was it. There's no more. I was not expecting a creepy pasta story with so much lore. And that only and the thing is that that story received an eight out of ten. Oh my gosh, bookworm. Now we received an 8 out of 10, not a 9. What? Makes no sense. 8 out of 10 would be a 10 out of 10, but too convoluted. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna make sure that the next story, and probably the final story tonight, doesn't have any links. Okay, I'm gonna have to save this for ne another night. Doesn't mean I'm ending. I'm gonna save those two. Probably for the, the SCP story night. Read those two. Nah, I'll save those for another night. Alright, so... Are you serious? There's a creepy boss story about Hugh O'Brien. 
at no. No, the rating's out of 10. It was like an 8 out of 10, but I would have rated higher. Yeah, of course. Very red, don't let them in and turn it off. Ooh, this actually looks interesting. How long is it? Okay, we'll add that. How much is this one? Okay, so we get two more stories. They're both short. All right, both short stories. One's 10 minutes, one's 13 minutes. All right, we all ready? Here are the final stories of the night. All right. The Living, the Living History Project. One of my least favorite parts of about being a middle school history teacher is the bullshit living history assignments we give at the end of every school year. Kids are supposed to sit with their grandparents and videotape, voice record, or transcribe their oldest memories for posterity. And for an easy way to bring up their GPA. I have been doing this for 17 years. And when I collected the projects this time around. I assume they would be as dull if not duller than usual. This, is, this had not been a particular bright class. So I went home, poured myself a glass of wine. And prepared for a long night of. I only owned two pairs of pants when I was your age. And my brother got beat with a newspaper for hitting a baseball in the neighbor's yard. Of course, these projects were peppered with innocent old person comments. They're so horribly sexist and racist, you just had to laugh. Now, I had a girl in my class whom I, I will call Olivia. She, she was a pudgy, quiet, and proved herself consistent B student. I expected her project to be as unremarkable as her, and perhaps that's why I was so profoundly disturbed by what I what I witnessed that night. Olivia had submitted two discs for some reason, so I began with the one marked interview. The screen hiccuped twice before a grainy image of a living room came into view. The place was a hoarder's hell. Olivia was curled up in an armchair, armchair clutching a notebook and looking like a scared animal. Across from her sat a man with a somber continuance, smoking a cigarette and staring at her expectantly. Go, go ahead. A woman's voice whispered from behind the camera. Olivia's owlish eyes flashed towards the screen and then back to the man. I am here with my great uncle Stephen. She began almost inaudibly. He's going to tell us about his oldest memories from being in the army. Great uncle Stephen looked like he'd rather be in a goddamn trench at the moment, but he waited patiently for the questions to begin. Not surprisingly, Olivia read verbatim from the suggested questions sheet I'd handed out to the students. He answered her Currently, once or twice, I heard her mother whisper, Speak up, Olivia. And behind the camera, Typical boring shit. So, I was intrigued when Olivia set down the notebook and asked, Did you like being in the army? That was totally off script. Great Uncle Stephen emitted a clean smoker's wheeze. No. Nope. Glad to get out of the town, though. It's not the voice. Fuck. Give me a moment. Okay. Alright. Give me a moment.
No, I'm glad to get out of town, though. Where'd you go? Falcons. Uh-huh. She said... She said, I doubted she knew what the Balkans were. My suspicion was confirmed when she asked. Was Bacchus very different from, from here? Yes. Mom cleared her throat and behind the camera, perhaps encouraging Great Uncle Stephen to be a little more forthcoming. But Olivia s seemed generally interested. Uncle Stephen, she asked. What is your worst memory of the army? The old man crushed his cigarette in the ashtray and slowly lifted himself out of the chair. I'll be back. He mumbled the camera cut off. When the screen flashed back, everything was, exa was the exact same except great uncle Stephen had several pieces of paper and plucked his Plastic sleeves laid on top all the crap sitting on his coffee table. One he held in his hand. I was a kid when I was listed. He said, looking at Olivia. Your brother's age. He told her. Olivia nodded. I never saw combat, but with my deployments in the cities when he's the youth, they had been deployed by civil wars. Everything was a mess. But like a janitor for fuck's sake. Him, Mom coughed. Great Uncle Stephen sighed and looked at, at his paper. My unit was assigned to a school that had been obliterated by the violence, broken windows, cave in rooms, and for some reason the part that got me most was, was that the school had been like this for years. Before we even got there, no one had lifted a finger to fix it. I saw kids walking by the way, the begging for their money, for whatever shit they did. Camera dipped towards the floor as I heard Mom whisper harshly at Great Uncle Stephen. I couldn't make out what he was, she was saying, but it wasn't hard to imagine. Do you want to hear this goddamn story or not? I heard him back, I heard him bark in response. Then you better let, let me tell it how I want. Mom, Olivia chimed. Please stop interrupting. Are you presenting this to the front of the class? No, Mom, we're just handing it to the teacher. I'm sure I'm sure he said was the word shit before. Right, Uncle Stephen contributed, hopefully. I wasn't a he, as a matter of fact, but other than that, the statement was accurate. The camera was lifted, and after a, a couple of blurry focus adjustments, the shot was the same as before. Ah, I'm talking too much anyway. He grumbled. He lifted a piece of paper in his hand and closed his face. In the basement, I found this letter. I don't know what it said, but a buddy of mine translated it. So I'm going to read it now, and then I'll tell you what I saw in that basement. A chill ran down my spine. Mom zoomed in. To Great Uncle Stephen in his letter. His pal side hands trembled as he held up the paper. This is what he read Dear Sir, I never loved my country, so many of these skirmishes are born from patriotism, a power struggle from Shah the Great, once Great Empire, but I don't care what the name of my home was on the map. This is fine, this fine is senseless, and I, and I stay as far away from it as I can. It was not these attacks and disorganized violence that took the lives of my wife and child. It was illness. Mercifully, and it happened quickly for the baby. Now just suffered for longer. And I watched my horror knowing that I could do nothing for them. Only the solace is that I was there for them every step of the way. I stopped going to work every day. And, not, and no one came after me. I thought that, no, that they noticed I was gone since the school was simply Across the field, visible from the window. It could have been easy for to go hours each day and come home quickly to care for them. But what was the point? All I did was clean the floors. I was used as well as I was to my family. I tried to take Nadja to the hospital, but the journey was too long and taxing. I brought her home, and she died at that, that night. 
I did not in the babe was gone, well, I don't remember much. But I left the hotel, barely ate and slept. Thought many times to take my own life, to th there was, was. I felt paralyzed by my own helplessness. The only thing that kept me sane was my radio. I never turned it off once, even though I didn't listen to the words being said. In fact, the channel I got was the clearest was in English, I think. Which I don't speak of lick of. But the voice and music was to his notch life existed beyond the fine city sustained me. I have no idea how much time passed before I saw the light of day again. I was dizzy from hunger, so finding food was my priority. My radio came with me, of course. Since I was holed up, it was gone everywhere with me. It takes, it talks to me as I sleep and it has a wake. I don't know what it was saying, but I know it would die without it. Once I had some water and food, it occurred to me that the only thing left to do was go back to work, so I did. The following morning, I simply returned to school where I was a janitor and got back to work. Nobody made a big deal of it. out of it. Like I said, Nigel had been sick for a long time, and those who worked at the school knew it. I appreciate no one had pestered me to come back to work during the hottest days of my life. She just never said much to me, but we smiled at each other in the house. And that mutual respect was perhaps the reason I decided to come back after all. The place had gone into the docks without me, so I simply grabbed my broom and rags from my closet and set to cleaning. Everyone was grateful to have me back, I know. But the best part is that nobody minds my radio. I bring it with, with me everywhere and keep the volume low enough that the stairs stoots. No one has ever complained. In fact, I suspect they like it. The schoolhouse is not very big, but it does require a lot of maintenance. The floors are always sticky and stained, so I spend most of my time mopping. Kids make messes, and I guess that's why I am still in business. Sometimes I have to move things around to make sure I get every spot in the floor beautiful and clean, but I can take pride in that. And the repairs, the schools always need tune-outs. Here and there, and I happen to heal. Some days I'm constructing a desk. That broke it as I whistle along with the radio. Other times I handle more serious structural issues. Things when I have to work like this, I truly, I feel truly instrumental. Like a cog in a large machine. How could a school survive without me? It took me a long time, but I once again feel that I have purpose. There's a large, there's a ladder behind the school that is full of preserved food and allow a payment. I'm allowed to take as much food as I need. The arrangement is fine. What well, I do with mine anyways? I used to bring food back to my house just one field away from the school. But when I started sleeping in the basement, no one seemed to notice. The school is special to me and I cannot leave it unguarded. When I am besieged with memories of my wife and baby, I turn up the volume on the radio and drown out such thoughts. It's for me every time. Except this morning, because this morning, I woke up to dead silence. Frankly, explaining the radio, I had to see what had happened. Honestly, I cannot tell you how many days in a row I had been using it. Did it simply live out its life and die naturally? I had spent the entire day trying to fix it. Most of the time I have been crying, I am almost losing my mind without it. I am getting myself until sundown. If I cannot fix it by then, then I'm going to take my life. I'm riding this because the sunlight is starting to die, and I know what my fate shall be. I have thought about the long last night walk through the halls of my school, saying goodbye to students and teachers. I know I'll be missed, but I cannot bring myself to leave this room. I cannot go anywhere knowing that my radio is dead in here. There are no more tears in me. It feels now like I can catch my breath. I found what little food I had in my stomach, and I'm growing dizzy again. Like it did after Nacha died. I am not long for this world. But before I take my life, I closed the door to this room and struck a chair between the handle. It's the only room in the basement that has a small casement that lets in just enough light for me to see what I'm doing. Anyone is kind enough to come looking for me, they should not be met with this gruesome sight. Press soon to see the door is blocked. Smell my rotten body and simply forget I ever existed. But I have placed both my radio and the stone outside the door. Kind sir, if you're reading this, I have one humble request. Please fix it. Save my radio. 
It did not start to die in a sleep, and I ashamed that I cannot revive it. Now I'm ready to join Nacha and, and little Lumia in heaven. How this, how this school can find another janitor who loves cares for the way I do. The hour is now. Do not forget my radio. Stand as I When mom zoomed back out, Olivia had tears in her eyes. Thank you for sharing, Uncle Steven. Mom said with her voice choked. I think we had enough. Wait, Olivia chirped. You said there's more. What did you find? Before great uncle Stephen could f open his mouth, the image disappeared. My jaw dropped. What was it? What did great uncle Stephen see? I probably remembered that there was a second disc. The one was unmarked, but I hoped to contain the rest of the interview. There was no video, only audio. The voice that started up was Olivia's. Hi, Miss Gertie. I'm sorry about my mom, but she refused to record the rest of what my uncle was saying, but I accidentally continued and secretly recorded the story as a voice memo on my phone. I remember what you said earlier this year, that history is written by people who win wars. She sucked in a breath and commenced crying. But everyone's history is important, even if they are sad, pathetic people, and even if they never won a single thing in their life. I haven't slept through the night since I finished this project. But you have to hear what my uncle has to say. There were tears in my eyes, too, and the sincerity of her words was beautiful. I was also flattered that she had to remember some of trite phrase I threw around because it was what my history teacher said to me. Before I got too sappy over it, the audio began again. Fine, came on's frustrated voice. If you want to hear the rest of the story, fine. This is not appropriate for a school subject. Let me finish. Great Uncle Steven snapped. If it's too much for you, help yourself to a snack in the kitchen. Olivia wants to know what happened. I heard, I heard her mother mumble something and walk away. Olivia and her uncle were alone. I imagined her looking at him expectantly. So did she find the radio? Or did it get ruined when the school got blown up? He rest, and I heard the distinct click of a lighter. That letter, he began slowly, had a date on it. What date? She inquired hungrily. It was it was dated two weeks before we started rebuilding the school. Didn't you say the school had been destroyed like two years ago? Yes. Replied Great Uncle Stephen. It had been. There was silence as it, it, I felt goosebumps on my arms. The images that came to my mind were were almost too overwhelming to express, but Great Uncle Stephen put them, put them into words effortlessly. Clearly, he had spent his whole life thinking about it. This man, this Stanislav, went to a vandalized, falling apart schoolhouse. He cleaned up blood and rumble like it was spilled drinks and dust. He smiled at dead bodies in the hallway and believed they were smiling back at him because they, they liked his radio. He moved around corpses so he could sweep the ground under them. The roof was half collapsed, so when it rained, he must have gotten soaking wet. But it was, but it was so obvious that he didn't even feel a thing. I could hear Olivia crying steadily. I found the liner he was talking about. It was all pickled, reserved food, and probably tasted like shit. Most of the stuff was moldy. Did did you see the dead body? Yes, hanging from the ceiling, but still amazingly lifelike. He wasn't riding away. This hadn't happened years ago. Did he look peaceful? She asked, a chord of desperation in her voice. I couldn't tell you. The smell was rank, and his face was blue, and his eyes was bulging like this. I imagine him demonstrating. In the radio? 
Olivia wept. I heard a great Uncle Stephen take a long drag of his cigarette. It was there, all right. And it was still on. That's it. <laughs> Interesting. Yep. Yeah, I forgot to mention earlier, but like you you like that voice that I gave the news article from the previous story? I saw that you reacted to the voice, but I didn't want to stop reading. Yeah, it was a great all-time radio announcer voice. It's really hard for me to get back into the voice because I tried doing that for the grandpa. It's like a hit or miss with me. I'm, I'm so training to learn it. Like, I can do it. It just takes a bit. <laughs> I'm just glad I was able to get it right there perfectly. Anyways, ready to hear the final story of the night? Alright. The final story of the night is artificial. Artificial. Take a drink first. I didn't stop. Oh, wait, wrong voice. I didn't stop running. I suppose I could have if I wanted to. But the thought of what would happen to me if I stood still for any more than a second frightened me to death. My breaths grew louder and louder as I ran down the dull gray hallway, which I had casually walked through so many times before. My head spun as I turned around the corner and collided with Dr. Jane Prescott, my co-worker. Jennifer! Mr. Dr. Prescott exclaimed as a stack of papers she had been carrying dumped out of her hands and spilled all over the hallway floor. She adjusted the thick black glasses which had knocked loose from in the impact and asked, Jennifer, what's wrong? I, I am so, so sorry. I panted heavily as Dr. Prescott held me by both of my shoulders. I don't, I knelt down to help Dr. Prescott pick up her papers, but she tightened her grip on my arms and lifted me back up. Don't worry about the papers, dear, she said with her soothing southern accent. That's just some dumb pe pioneer mumbo jumbo. When I, Want to know is why you're running through the labs with such energy. I opened my mouth to answer her before I realized what I, that I had absolutely no clue why I was running. Last thing I remembered, I was sitting in the break lounge, drinking a cup of iced tea, and watching the news on the tiny television that Pioneer Electronics provided its employees with. The next thing I knew, 
I had a strong sense of deja vu coupled with the horrible feeling that my life was about to end suddenly. For whatever reason, writing seemed to help. I went around to answer her before I realized that I absolutely I had no ask clue why I was running. Last thing I remember was sitting in the break lounge, drinking a cup of iced tea, and watching the news on the on a tiny television that Pioneer Electronics provided its employees with. The next thing I knew, I had a strong sense of deja vu, coupled with a horrible feeling that my life was about to end very suddenly. For whatever reason, running seemed to help. I guess I was just having a panic attack. I answered, putting on a fake smile. I guess I was just having a panic attack. I answered, putting on a fake smile. How long has it been since you had a panic attack? Dr. Prescott asked, with concern in her voice. Not since my sophomore year of high school, I told her. Are you going to be okay? Oh yeah, I assured her. I, I think I'll be fine now. I just, you know, I'm okay. Well, that's good. Just remember, dear, if you ever feel sick at all, just let me know. And you'll be on your way home. I'll call a taxi and everything. Jane, I'm fine. I repeated, realizing too late that the only times I called Dr. Prescott Jane were when I was nervous. Or when I was nervous. I hoped that sh she hadn't picked up on that painfully obvious tell of mine. Well, if you... If you're sure that you'll be able to keep going today, then I have some good news for you. Cliff just sent me a message that the power issue is fixed. Stephen is ready to go online. Oh, oh yeah. I shook my head and remembered what I'd been working on before. I went to the break room and had spent the last two years developing an advanced artificial intelligence unit. With Dr. Prescott, the woman who had been my boss, up to the point when she promoted me to co-manager, and Ian Bell, my intern, we had co-named the project Stephen. The purpose of Stephen was creating an artificial intelligence, or AI, which acted, talked, and even thought just like a human. We didn't want him to be perfect, which is what most AIs are, especially those AI made by Pioneer Electronics. We wanted Stephen to make mistakes, lie, and cheat for the purpose of self-preservation, just like any human would. It was a huge project which became a part when we discovered that the computer which we were trying to run Stephen on couldn't handle his program. One trip down to Clifford Hanks to ask him to work his maintenance magic, and the program was fixed within an hour. Wow, an hour? I thought checking my watch... Is that really all it's been? Feels like I, I went down to him yesterday. Well, are you gonna go going to go or what, dear? Dr. Prescott interrogated me. Yeah, yeah, of course. I grinned, turning my attention back to the situation at hand. Why don't you go and find Ian and you two can sit in the conversation room while I boot up Steven? You bet, dear. She said as I bent down to pick up the papers again. She shooed me away. Go on, I, I already told you. I have to get this. I nodded excitedly, turned around, and headed back in the direction that I was running from. After two years of working with the brightest programmer I've ever met, I was finally going to meet our fantastic creation. While I knew I was going, supposed to be happy about this big moment, I still had a horrible sense of fear in the pit of my stomach. I turned and entered the door to the tiny lab, which had been left wide open. I walked over to the computer to the right of the door and turned on the enormous monitor. As I walked, f as I waited for her to boot up, I wandered over to the opposite side of the lab and looked through the window to the observation room. Dr. Prescott and Ian were just getting settled in. I flashed them an enthusiastic thumbs up before grabbing the rolling chair, which had somehow wound up on the same side of the lab. 
I stole window to the observation room and guided it back to the computer monitor. I sat down on the blue cushion and rolled as close as the keyboard as I could get without breaking my ribs, before finally slipping the switch on the Pioneer memory box. The monitor went dark for a moment, but after five seconds, a bright blue light lit up the entire lab. I waited for, I waited with bated breath for a face to form in the light, but unfortunately, it didn't come. Dr. Lane, we don't think it's working. Ian's shaky voice whispered in my ear, making me jump. I had forgotten that I was wearing an earpiece. I, I know, I said disappointed. Ian and I are gonna go to, go, going to go in, Dr. Prescott started to say, but she was interrupted by a low hume emanating from the computer's speakers. H Hello? I asked, feeling a little silly, that I was talking to what could still be an inanimate object. To my delight, the hum rose to form a slow but audible word. Hello? Steven? Yes, yes. This, this is Steven. Can you hear me? Jen... There? You keep slowing down every now and then, but yeah, I can hear you. How did you know my name? Steven's smooth, calm voice asked me. I was about to ask you the same question. I commented with the same tone of voice. My excitement of hearing Steven's voice was hampered. The moment I heard him say my name, I had not broken him to know my name. My no name hadn't been spoken since I started him up, at least not into any microphone that Stephen could hear that through. And according to the first rule of Pioneer Artificial te Intelligence Units, as soon as any AI becomes too self-conscious, it needs to be deleted. A self-conscious AI could cause serious damage to the company. Then Steven said something that reinforced my thoughts. I know your name because I programmed you. But there's no reason for you to know my name. Actually, Steven, I programmed you. I corrected him. No, that's not possible. Stephen said, his voice dipped down again. I spent years working on you. There's no chance that I was just created. I actually gave you all of your memories, I explained. You remember when you were three and you fell off the lawn chair and got that scar on your cheek? I programmed you to think that. Stephen didn't answer for a while, but when he finally did, he said, Jennifer, I'll be right back. As he said this, the blue computer monitor dimmed a little bit. Jennifer? Ian broke the silence. Could you come back here, please? Yeah. I said, without turning my head, I stood up and exited the lab. I opened the first door on the right side of the hall to find Dr. Prescott and Ian sitting on two of the four chairs in our observation room. Dr. Lane, we need to talk about what just happened. Ian said calmly as Dr. Prescott gestured for me to sit in a chair next to him. What was that, dear? Dr. Prescott asked as I perched myself gingerly on the orange plastic chair across from her. I honestly don't know, I responded. I want to see him think like a human, not think he was one. And he thinks he programmed you, Ian added. You didn't do that, did you? 
No, I didn't. I gave him all of his memories, but I'm sure there was no memory of programming me. Dr. Prescott spoke up. We have quite the dilemma here, don't we? What do you mean? Ian asked. Well, think about it, do you? Stephen thinks he's a human. We think we're humans. Stephen thinks he programmed us. We think we programmed him. In fact, right now, Stephen's probably having the same conversation with some of his co-workers. I didn't program any personalities except for Stephen, I said. But you gave him memories of friends, a job, and a family, didn't you? And you made it so that he would continue to make his own artificial memories after creation. So he wouldn't even know when his real life just started a couple months ago. You did that, didn't you? Yeah, I guess I did. I grabbed the corners of my pale white lab coat and began flapping them nervously. What are you getting at here, Jane? Think philosoph philosophically, dears. Dr. Prescott stood up and approached the large window, which covered the majority of the wall to the right of the entrance. The blue computer screen flickered as if we it knew we were watching it. Could someone please spell it out for me? Ian asked, breaking the silence, silent tension, which had just filled the room. Dr. Prescott turned back towards us and pushed her thick glasses up her aged nose. All I'm saying is that it's past that we don't exist. Okay, that doesn't make any sense. I scoffed, standing up. I exist, okay? If I didn't exist, how could I be thinking right now? Ian asked nearly knocking over his orange chair as he stood up as well. Just a thought, Dr. Prescott said defensively. She sat back down and Ian and I automatically lowered ourselves into our seats too. I closed my eyes and basked in the silence. What is going on? I wondered how it is possible that I don't exist. I know Dr. Prescott usually knows what she's talking about, but still, I don't know. But still, I know that I'm real. What did that guy with the girly name say? I think, therefore, I am. Just knowing that I can question my existence ensures that I exist, right? All right, let me talk to him again. I sighed, feeling a little bad for upsetting Dr. Prescott. I see what I can what I think. If I can't figure out what's going on here, I have no choice but to bring him offline. Dr. Prescott and Ian nodded simultaneously, understanding therefore I stood up and exited the observation room. As I entered the lab, the blue computer monitor grew brighter. Or brighter. Jennifer? Stephen's voice called from the screen. I sat down in the chair and noticed the faint outline of a man sitting in the blue light. I'm here, Stephen, I said. Can we talk a little more? Funny, I was about to ask you the same question. Do you have any family? I asked, remembering the family I had programmed for him. I have a wife, Stephen replied. Her name is Melinda. What about kids? Two. They're both girls. What are their names? Madison is the older one. She's 13. Lillian's 8. Would you like to see pictures of them? I'd love to. I smiled, 
The more we talked, the more apparent Stephen stood what on the screen became. I realized that he was holding the corners of my lab coat again, and I released them quickly. I knew that Stephen was feeling the same awkward tension that I was, which comforted me a little. The figure reappeared on the screen. By now, the blue light had faded enough for me to see Stephen's eyes, nose, mouth, and ears. I could even make out some blinking lights on the wall behind him. Here is my wife. Stephen smiled, holding a framed picture up to the camera. In it, I saw a man and a woman. The man was Stephen, but he looked much, much younger in a photograph than he did on my screen. The woman next to him, Melinda, had long, wavy brunette hair, a pair of big eyes, and a smile that stretched from ear to ear. I remember creating that picture. And these are my children, he said, taking the pictures of his wife away from the screen and said, holding up one of two girls sitting in a pumpkin patch. Maddie and Lil mean the world to me, he added quietly. They're beautiful, I told him, wiping a tear from my eye. Are you married, Jennifer? Yeah, I just got married, I said, a year ago today. What's his name? Jeff, Jeff Lane. Do you have any pictures? I already had a picture of Jeff in my head. Holding it up to the screen, I noticed Stephen's hazel eyes light up as he saw my husband's picture. I didn't take a genius to know he had seen it before. I took the frame away from the camera and set it back down the monitor. Stephen and I spent an hour talking about our families, friends, and jobs. Neither one of us mentioned AI again. It was like talking to a real human. Well, mission accomplished. I thought as I walked home that night, I wanted an AI that would think just like a human, and I got one. The next day at work, I found Ian before I found Dr. Prescott. I was glad that I got a chance to talk to him because he le had left the day before talking to me. A day about talking to me. Ian! I said, grabbing his shoulder as he passed by me. Can I have a word with you? Uh, yeah, sure. He said with a, some surprised look that he had always had in his eyes. He followed me to the break lounge where we both sat on the faded red couch that faced the offending machines. Ian, how late did you stay last night? I asked. I was, I was here until you said goodnight to Stephen. Ian answered. I left while you were staring at the blank computer screen. Oh, right. Cleared my throat and continued. So, you remember an entire conversation that we had with each other? Yeah? What do you think? Even though I didn't clarify what I meant, Ian already knew. I think that he's gonna have to go. That's what I was afraid of. I sighed, looking up at the dark television screen. I wanted to give Stephen one more chance for me to convince him that he wasn't real. But if things didn't go well, I'd have to delete the program from the, the Pioneer memory box. It wouldn't be a total loss. I backed up all the codes on Dr. Prescott's computer. If I had to delete Stephen, then we'd just go back to the code and figure out what went wrong. Ian went to find Dr. Prescott while I booted up Stephen's program. It only took a couple of seconds for the screen to turn blue. As the blue screen faded away, I saw Stephen sitting in a chair on the computer monitor. 
He squinted at the camera and asked, Jennifer, are you there? I'm here, Steven. I said, is something wrong? He inquired. No, why? You sound sad. Well, there's a lot going on today. You and I have a lot in common, Jennifer. Are you busy too? Not really, but I am sad. I have a strange feeling that we're both sad for the same reason, I said. Am I right, Stephen? Stephen was quiet for a moment, but then he said, Jennifer. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but there are protocols here that need to be followed. Yep, that's what I thought, I said, barely opening my mouth. We didn't get to talk about this much yesterday, Stephen, but you're an artificial intelligence, and you think that you're, you're, you're a human. Actually, Jennifer, you're the AI. And just the fact that you think you programmed me says that you can do permanent damage to this computer. Well, at least we both have the same feelings about this, I whispered. The question is, which of us is the real human? Actually, I had a chance to think about that. Stephen leaned forward in his chair. An AI has to have access to a computer's hard drive to run properly. The real AI would use his or her own computer as a means of controlling the real person's computer. Right? I nodded slowly. So no matter which of us deletes the other, the real AI will be deleted and the real person will be okay. That's right. Stephen and I looked at each other's eyes for a short time before I asked him, How sure are you that you are human? He looked a little looked taken back. Well, he said, up until yesterday when I met you, 100%. Now I'm a little iffy. I groaned. I was in the exact same boat. It would be nice if we could stay friends, I told Stephen. He nodded. It would. We have a lot in common. However, protocols are clear. We could both get fired for leaving the other here. Dine won't be bad, I declared confidently. What do you mean? I mean that, at least if you're an AI, you won't even know that you died. I program you to record your entire life. When you die, you'll relive your life over and over again. Stephen and Grimace grimaced and nodded. I did the same for you, he said. You won't relive the entire life you remember, just your real life. From the moment you first Activated by me. You won't remember that all of this already happened. You won't even know that you died. I nodded my head and noticed that my eyes were starting to water. I buried my ha hand inside my sleeve of my lab coat and wiped the tears away. So, I breathed. Which of us should delete the other? I will, Stephen said. I'll delete you. If after I do this, you are still sitting there, that means that I was the real AI. If you don't remember this conversation, then you were the AI. Just do it, I said quickly, wiping my eyes again. Steve nodded. Goodbye. Jennifer, he whispered hoarsely.
Goodbye, Stephen. Stephen broke eye contact with me and began typing away at his computer. The typing echoed through the speakers next to my screen. I turned around and saw Dr. Prescott and Ian practically pressing their noses up against the grass window with in anticipation. As I turned back around to face the computer, I was shocked to find that Stephen was fading away. He was slowly getting replaced with the same blue screen that I saw when I first activated him. However, even though the video was fading, the audio kept growing louder and louder. The buttons on Steven's keyboard tapped away at my brain, causing every last cell to vibrate violently. I couldn't take it anymore. I needed to move. I, I couldn't just sit here and listen to S as Steven destroyed himself. I stood up so quickly that the blue rolling chair rolled all the way to the window of the observation room to the other side of the lab. Dr. Prescott and Ian were no longer sitting there. They were gone. I ran out of the lab the moment I entered the hallway. I felt like someone started squeezing my lungs. Oh no. Not again. I thought it was a, it's another panic attack. I felt dizzy. Every direction I turned, I felt like there were, would be someone waiting there to grab me and take me somewhere far away where I, I'd never be seen again. Leave me alone! I screamed with the little air left in my chest. I didn't even know who I was screaming at. I just couldn't stand still and wait for someone to take me. I turned my head and realized that I was standing outside of the small lab. I turned to the right and ran down the hall. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know where I thought I could go. I just couldn't think straight. I didn't stop running. I suppose I could have if I wanted to, but the thought of what would happen to me if I stood still for any more than a second frightened me to death. My breath grew louder and louder as I ran down the dull gray hallway, which I casually walked through so many times before. My head spun as I turned the corner and collided with Dr. Prescott. Jennifer, Dr. Prescott explained as the stack of papers she had been carrying dumped out of her hands and spilled all over the hallway floor. She adjusted the thick black glasses, which had been knocked loose from the impacts, and asked, Jennifer, what's wrong? I'm so, so sorry. I panted heavily as Dr. Prescott held me bo by both of my shoulders. I, I knelt down to help Dr. Prescott pick up her papers. But she tightened her grip on my arms and lifted me back up. Don't worry about the papers, dear. She insisted. That's all just some dumb pioneer mumble jumbo. What I want to know is, is why you're running through the labs with such energy. I opened my mouth to answer her before I realized that I had absolutely no clue why I was running. Okay, that ended off really well. However, I had a feeling that she was the AI. Because if you remember, at the beginning of the story, uh, some things that she said I were repeated. Yeah, I opened her mouth to answer before. I opened her mouth to answer before. It was repeated. Yeah. Hold on, I'll reread re it for you, Bookworm. I opened my mouth to answer her before I realized that I was absolutely no clue why I was running. The last thing I remembered, I was sitting in the break, break lounge, drinking a cup of iced tea, and watching the news on the tiny television that Pioneer Electronics provided its boys with. The next thing I knew, I had a strong sense of deja vu, coupled with the horrible feeling that my life was about to end very suddenly. For whatever reason, running seemed to help. I opened my mouth to answer her before I realized that I had absolutely no clue why I was running. Last thing I remembered, I was sitting in the break lounge, drinking a cup of iced tea, and watching the news on the tiny television that Pioneer Electronics provided its boys with. Next thing I knew, I had a strong sense of deja vu, coupled with a horrible feeling that my life was about to end suddenly. For whatever reason, running seemed to help. I had a feeling... I mean, it's still in it off great.
But that just makes me wonder. Is Ian and Prescott an AI? Or not? Like, is it just, like, memories of people? Now she's stuck in a loop. Completely unaware that she's an AI. Yeah. Probably just her memories I gave her. Yeah. Oh my god, this is starting to piss me off. I, I don't know. It, I, it's, any scene is muted. God damn it. Anyways. Anyways. Yeah. I, I'm creating raid words. For whenever hatchet or, you know. Elethics, depending on. Who's on? Trust me, these are gonna be good raid words. I'm just annoyed I'm having to type this shit out. I mean, if Hatchet's still going, it'd probably be better if I raid Hatchet, because I think this will confuse Lithics too much. I can still be heard, right? Okay.
dire red emblem as me. Remember, everyone, the true horrors are the things that humanity creates. So like, comment, subscribe, and follow. Bright! Ha! Ain't that the truth? Fire Red Emblem. Humanity has a knack for creating its own little nightmares, doesn't it? Good old Dr. Bright's got it spot on. You folks watching better hit that like button faster than Batman chasing down a lead. And don't forget to subscribe, or you might find yourself in one of those creepy tales next time. Ha ha! Oh my god, it, 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 I love that, Bookworm. This took me so long, Bookworm. That took me so goddamn long to type in. Because the creepy boss is wicked, doesn't lie to the, the fucking highlight and paste and copy and shit. Oh my god. Let's make sure Hatch is still streaming. Oh god, why is everything loading so slow? Oh, because I'm still streaming. Oh. Hatchet is not streaming. I guess they ended early. Then I guess we will we'll, we will be using this for analytics. It's gonna confuse the fuck out of them. Thanks for the Tangia words. <laughs> Anyways. Anyways. Okay, so everyone's ready. Got it. Give me a moment. Anyways, Danger News, I hope you enjoyed all the horror stories. I try to do, at least try and do one of these a week. I have edited version of Rayworks. Oh, god damn it. Anyways, hope to see you guys next time for your next mission. And, um, penis is my ass. Oh, Jerry, hi. <laughs> I came back just to hear you fine.